Ouais. Texas, the Grand Jury of Dallas County, State of Texas, duly organized at the July term, AD 2022, of the 265th Judicial District Court for said county, upon its oath to present and into said court in said term. And Nestor Hernandez, here and after called defendant, on about the 22nd day of October 2022, in the county of Dallas, State of Texas, did unlawfully then and there intentionally and knowingly cause the death of an individual to wit Jacqueline Pacula by shooting deceased with a firearm, a deadly weapon. And during the same criminal transaction, said defendant did then and there intentionally and knowingly cause the death of another individual to wit Katie Flowers by shooting deceased with a firearm, a deadly weapon. And further, said defendant did unlawfully then and there intentionally and knowingly caused the death of an individual to wit Jacqueline Pacua by shooting deceased with a firearm and deadly weapon and during a different criminal transaction for pursuant to the same scheme and course of conduct said defendant did then and there intentionally and knowingly cause the death of another individual to wit Katie Flowers by shooting the deceased with a firearm and deadly weapon against the peace and dignity of the state signed by the foreman of the grand jury. Thank you. <coughs> so the indictment, what does the defendant plead? Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen, the jury defendant will enter a plea of not guilty. Thank you. Uh, does he decide which to invoke the rule at this time? Your Honor, the defense would invoke the rule with the acceptance previously placed on the record. And the statement is well, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Each side is instructed to instruct their witnesses not to remain in the courtroom while testimony is going on. And for those who have testified not to discuss their testimony with any other witness or any other individual involved in this trial. All right, does the state wish to make an opening statement? Yes, Go ahead. Thank you. May I please report? Yes. Counsel. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, jury. You would think that the maternity ward of a hospital would be the happiest place on earth. New parents basking in the joy bonding with, spending time with their new born bundles of joy. You would also think that it would be the safest place in the world as mothers, fathers, hospital staff members take the utmost care to protect these small, newborn, precious babies. However, that image came crashing down on October the 22nd, 2022, when this defendant Nestor Hernandez wreaked hell on earth 
at Methodist Central Hospital, not a five minute drive from where we sit at today. You see, he was angry. He was angry with his child's mother, Selena Villatoro, because he suspected that she was cheating on him. So on October the 22nd, 2022, he took a beer, he took a gun, and he took a mindset of murder to the maternity ward at Methodist Central Hospital. He got on the floor, the fourth floor of Methodist Central Hospital, the Central Tower, where the maternity ward is located, actually called technically the postpartum unit. Approximately 10.30 a.m. At that time, he proceeded into the room of Selena Del Toro, and she will tell you everything, all the horrors, all the terror that happened in that room that day. He entered the room, she said he had a can of beer, and you asked to see that on some surveillance video from the hospital. She said automatically she knew that there was going to be a problem, because she knows how he gets when he's drinking. She would say that he became irate. He began to accuse her of having somebody inside the room. So he actually began checking the room. He checked inside the closet. He checked inside the restroom. Tell me who you have in here. Don't play with me. She didn't have, of course, anybody inside their room. At that point in time, he began to assault her. He took out the handgun, and he began to hit her upside the head multiple times with the fire. He threatened to kill her. He threatened to kill himself. He said, we're going to die today. We're going to be on the news. Not only that, she will tell you that he said, the next person that comes into this room is going to die also. Unfortunately, the next person that entered that room was Methodist hospital worker, social worker Jacqueline Bakul. Unsuspectingly, she was going in to complete some paperwork to, 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 with Selena. Routine paperwork, just doing her job, just like everybody else in the hospital that day. Selena will tell you that the defendant got up off the couch, he walked behind Ms. Bakul, and he shot her in the head, killing her instantly. She fell on the floor. At that time, the defendant walks toward the front door of the hospital room, pulls up his gun, and he aims, and he shoots. At that time, by the grace of God, Sergeant Robert Ron Hill of the Methodist Police Department was on the floor, tending to an unrelated call. You'll hear from Sergeant Ron Hill this morning. He will tell you that he heard the gunshot. Now, at that point in time, he didn't know what it was. Of course, nobody would suspect hearing a gunshot in the returning ward, right? So he began to walk towards the room to investigate the origin of the sound. At that point in time, the other complainant in this case, Katie Annette Flowers, a nurse in Methodist Hospital, again, just doing her job like everybody else in the hospital, she heard the sound as well. And you'll see on video, and both her and Sergeant Ron Hill kind of converged there at the front door of the room. <clears throat> That's when the defendant, again, draws up his gun. He fires a shot, a couple of shots, into the room, sorry, into the hallway. And at that point in time, he strikes Katie Flowers in the neck. She's able to muster enough strength Obviously, you know that she's injured at that point, bleeding, as you will see on video, to make it down to the nurse's station, where she collapses. And later she succumbs, unfortunately, to her injuries. She passes away. At that point in time, Sergeant Ron Hill engages with the defendant. Selena will tell you that the defendant, at that point in time, he was not done with his rampage. He goes back inside the room. He begins to reload the weapon. He begins to walk outside of the room. At that point in time, Sergeant Rangel engages with the defendant, firing one time and striking the defendant in the leg. The defendant retreats back inside the room. He collapses. He drops the gun. Selena is able to secure the weapon. At this point in time, multiple officers have converged on the room, both Methodist police officers and Dallas police officers giving loud commands, throw out the weapon, let them go, let them out of the room, 
Check her out. And I neglected to mention, most importantly, that newborn, two-day-old baby, Jaden Sanchez, was inside the room the whole time in the arms of his mother, Selena Villatoro, as this defendant assaults her by pistol whipping her with the weapon. Selena is able to secure the weapon, and she throws it outside the room as the officers are ordering them to do. At that point in time, the officers are able to make entry into the room and they take the defendant into custody. You will see all this for yourselves. And multiple officers will testify. They all had on body cams. We will show you that video today. You will see the officers make entry into the room. You will see the officers take the defendant into custody. You will see the defendant's face on camera multiple times. They lay him on the ground and they begin to administer him first aid for his gunshot wound to his right leg. Now, isn't that ironic that officers have raced to the scene to try and save this man's life as he bleeds out while he has just killed two people? But of course, he's here today. You will hear forensic evidence that will show you that the defendant's DNA was all over the crime scene, all over the weapon used in this case to kill these two individuals. You hear that there was gunshot residue on his hands. You will hear that the firearm that he used in this offense matched to the ballistics at the crime scene, including fire chill casings, as well as projectiles that were recovered from the bodies of the victims during their autopsies. The evidence in this case is very clear, ladies and gentlemen. Again, you'll see video, you'll see forensic evidence, you'll see photographs. The evidence in this case is overwhelming. There will be no reasonable doubt. The state will prove to you each and every element of the indictment that I just read to you that this defendant is guilty of killing two individuals during the same criminal transaction. The victims in this case, the Jacqueline Pacula, Katie and Beth Flowers, there will be no reasonable doubt at the close of this case that this defendant, Mr. Hernandez, is guilty of the offense of capital murder, and I ask that you will find your guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. <coughs> Very briefly, Your Honor. Please, court. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be very brief. Uh, I think everybody yesterday that was involved in the board of our selection process uh, very eloquently spoke about the rules of law that apply and what your duties are as jurors in this case. As I stand here before you, I stand here knowing that every one of you is very aware that we have no burden in this case, that the burden rests on this table. And what I'm going to do at this time is I'm going to just ask you, because as the prosecutor stood here and gave his version of what he believes this evidence is going to show, I believe that the evidence in this case is going to have some twists and turns that they're not anticipating. And I tell you that because, again, you will judge the evidence on the totality of the evidence that's provided to you. And I'm going to stand here now and only ask you to do one thing. Do not make your mind up about anything until both sides have rested in court. <coughs> Wait to hear everything that may be presented before you start forming an opinion about the guilt of the defendant in this case. Because I submit to you that when all the evidence is before you in this case, that the proper verdict will be a verdict of guilty to a lesser offense. The lesser offense of murder as opposed to capital murder. And I believe that the reasons why will become self-evidence during the course of this trial. So keep an open mind, please. Do what you guaranteed us that you would do yesterday in Board Dyer, and do your job as jurors and stay that way through the totality of the case. Thank you. Thank you, State call your first witness. Yes, Your Honor. The state calls <coughs> Okay. 
Can you swear that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Yes. How are you? Good, so. Doing well, thank you. If you could please introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling for the court reporter, please. <coughs> My name is Kevin Bonsu, K E V I N B O N S U. And Kevin, uh, do you live here in Dallas? No. Okay, where do you live? I live in Boston, Massachusetts. Okay, and do you work for a living? Yes. What do you do for work? Come again? What do you do for work? I'm a network engineer. I have a university. At Harvard University? Yes. Now, Kevin, do you know one of the deceased in this case, uh, Jacqueline Pakua? Yes, she's my sister. Mr. Russell, with Charlie. Yes, she may. Kevin, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State Exhibit Number One. Is this your sister, Jacqueline yes. Pakua? Yes. Time around, the state's going to offer state exhibit number one, tender to defense counsel. Okay. All right, state exhibit number one is admitted for all purposes. Commissioner Post, you agree on it? Thank you. She's from Ghana. She was born in Ghana. Okay. And uh, do you know when she came to the United States? Mm, she came to the United States somewhere around 1998. Okay. And do you remember for what purpose she came to the United States from Ghana? To go to school. To feather, to feather her education. For education. To go to college, yeah. Okay. And what kind of education did she receive here in the United States? Uh, she went to college for... She went to college for uh, social work. Um, did uh, you and your sister have any other siblings? Yes. Okay, how many siblings do you have? We have seven in total. Okay, can you tell me their names? Uh, Michael or Joe Beffy. And how old is Michael? Michael is 43. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Clara Bonsu. How old Clara? 35. Okay. Uh, I'll say Boche. If you could, if you could spell the name for the corporate, I'm sorry. Uh, could you spell Osei? Uh, o S E I. And the last name? B O A K Y E. Okay, and how's Osei? Uh, 42. Okay. Next up, Elsie Boache. Can you spell that for the court reporter, please? E L S E B O A K Y E. And how was Elsie? Elsie's around 42, 43. Okay, next up, Telma Bonsu. Can you spell that, please? T H E L M A B O N S U. Age? 32. Okay. So a total of seven, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, did Jackie have any uh, children? Yes. And how many children did she have? Uh, one. Uh, son or daughter? A son. What was, uh, what was her son's name? Nigel Kojobidiakon. If you could please spell that for the court reporter. N-I-G-E-L. <coughs> K W A D O W and B I A D A I K O. And how old is Nigel now? 13. Uh, do you know where Nigel lives? Nigel lives in Ghana. Did he live with his mother up until the point of her death? Yes. Do you know where uh, Jackie lived while she was here in Dallas? In Mansfield, Texas. And 
And what did Jackie do for a living? She was a social worker. Do you know where she worked? Methodist Hospital. Do you know how long she worked there? Like a year. Can you talk about um, Jackie's education? Do you know where she went to school? Uh, she went to Renova uh, College in Minnesota. What was the name of the college? Renova. Can you spell it? Uh, w I N O N A. Yeah. Okay. Do you know um, what kind of degree she received? Uh, she received a bachelor's degree in uh, health. Okay. Do you know she received any other degrees? Uh, she later moved to Dallas and <clears throat> did her master's degree in social work. So obviously you don't live here in Dallas, you live in Boston. How about your other siblings? Do y'all do they live here locally or do they live kind of, uh, elsewhere? Elsewhere. Okay. Um, are some still located in Ghana? Yes. My name is Kelly Flowers, K E L L Y F L O W E R S. And Kelly, do you live here in Dallas County? Yes. Okay. Um, do you work for a living? I'm a full time student. Okay, what do you study? Real estate. Now, Kelly, do you know uh, one of the deceased in this case, uh, Katie and that Flowers? Yes, that's my mom. Mission Personal in charge. Yes, you may. I'm going to show you what's been marked in State's Exhibit Number Two. <coughs> Is that a photograph of your mother? Yes. <coughs> it's time the State's going to offer State's Exhibit Number Two to the Council. Okay. All right, State's Exhibit Two is admitted for all purposes. Permission to come to the jury hall. Yes, I have three siblings, Tracy, Rafe, and Sarah. Okay, say their names again. Tracy, Ralph, and Sarah. Can you tell me how old Tracy is? 34. 
No, 39. 38. Okay, I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm a terrible sister. That's okay. No worries. No worries about it. I won't ask you about the ages of the other two. Are they adults? Yes. Okay, and they're in the courtroom for support today? Um, both my sisters are. All right, where did, uh, where did your mother live um, here in Dallas? Rowlett, Texas. Okay, do you know how long she lived here? Um, about 20, well, in Rowlett, probably about 30, 35 years. Okay. Um, are there any grandchildren? Yes. Okay, how many grandchildren she have? Four. <clears throat> uh, what did your mom do for a living? She was a nurse. Okay. You know where she worked at the time of her death? Methodist Dallas. Do you know how long she worked there? Fifteen years. And do you know how long that she was worked as a nurse? Forty-one years. Did she have any kind of special training or degree um, in her field? She did. She had, a, had an associate's degree from El Centro. Um, do you know if she worked at any uh, hospitals prior to working at Methodist? Um, while she worked at Methodist, she would pick up extra shifts at Sunnyvale Hospital, and then prior to that, she worked at Mesquite Community Hospital. Um, and what kind of patients did she work with while she worked at Methodist? She worked with new mothers and their babies. Okay, well, did she take a particular joy or interest in that particular field of work? Oh, absolutely. She loved teaching new moms how to breastfeed, how to take care of their new babies. Um, she really encouraged breastfeeding, but of course she would um, respect what the patient wanted to do. And at the time of her death, was she working part-time or full-time at the hospital? Part-time. Okay, do you remember the time of her shift or when she would go in part-time? She worked on the weekends. She would work 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay, and about how long was she doing that? 10 years. October the 22nd, 2022, and you may or may not know this, but did you know if that was her regular shift to work that particular day? Yes. Yes, it was. I'll pass the minute, Sean. Thank you. We have no questions. Thank you. I'll make this witness be released. Okay, please, Sean. Okay. Just a Thank you, ma'am. Selena Villatoro, S-E-L-E-N-A, V-I-L-L-A-T-O-R-O. Could you bring the mic a little bit closer to your mouth so we can hear you, please? And talk about everything to the microphone, okay? And speak loud for us. Mm -hmm. Selena, how old are you? 26. <coughs> children? Yes, sir. How many children do you have? Just one. And what's your child's name? Jaden Xavier Sanchez. And how old is Jaden? He's a year. <clears throat> when is his birthday? October the 21st. Of what year? 2022. 
2022. Right. Now, Selena, do you know the defendant in this case, Mr. Hernandez? Yes, sir. How do you know Mr. Hernandez? Um, that was, that's my baby daddy. That's, yeah. Were y'all in a relationship at some point? Yes, sir. How long have you known the defendant? Um, since 2014. Yes. And how would you describe your relationship? Boyfriend, girlfriend? On and off, yeah. All right, so then I'm going to fast forward to the date of October 21st, 2022. Okay, the date uh, of the birth of your baby, Jake. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you recall going to the hospital that day? Um, yes, sir. Do you recall how you got there? Uh, yes, sir. How did you get there? Um, Dexter took me. The defendant took you to the hospital that day? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, at that point in time, did Nestor know that he was the father of the child? Yes, sir. Okay. What was his overall demeanor about you having his child? Mm, he was happy. Okay. Did he spend some time with, uh, at the hospital with you that day on the 21st? Uh, yes, sir. Um, any problems, any issues that day with Nestor? No, he was he was happy. He was taking care of my baby when I rested. All right, so let's go forward to the next day, October 22nd, 2022. Okay, did Nestor return to the hospital that day? Uh, yes, sir. Did you have any conversations with him prior to him coming to the hospital that day? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, do you recall the nature of the conversation that you had with him? Yeah, very. He was happy. He was asking me if he like should cut his hair so he could take pictures, and he just seemed happy. Okay. Um, and at some point, did he actually physically arrive at the hospital? Yes, sir. Was that uh, around ten thirty a.m. that morning? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and did he come into your room at that around that time? Yes, sir. Can you describe, um, did he have anything in his hands when he came into the room at that time? Yeah, when he came in, he had a, um, a beer in his hand. Okay. And just for the record, Selena, I'm going to have you identify Mr. Hernandez. Do you see him inside the courtroom today? Yes, sir. Can you identify him by what he's wearing this morning? Yeah, he's wearing the suit, the black suit. And just so the record is clear, if I'm seated in seat number one, my co-counsel is in seat number two, defense counsel is in three and four, all the way down the line, what seat would he be seated in? What number? He's in the fifth seat. Let the record reflect and uh, we can set identify the defendant in open court, John. The record will so reflect. Thank you. <coughs> and so he comes inside the room that morning with a beer. Selena, what are your thoughts at that point? I'm mad. Why are you mad? Because... Uh, I was I was tired and I just I was just waiting for him to come so he could help me take care of our son. But I mean, as soon as I seen the beer and I, I was mad. Um, and so you mentioned your baby. Was the baby in the room with you at the time? Mm, yes, sir. He was okay. asleep. I didn't mean to cut you off. Please say it. What, what was your answer? Yeah, yes, sir. He was asleep. He was sleeping. Okay. Was he with you or was he in somewhere else inside the room? Uh, he was on the side in his little basket. In the bassinet? Yeah, in the bassinet. Okay, and at this point, he's a day, a day old at this point. Your son? Yes, sir. Okay. So take us from there. Um, what is Nestor's demeanor at that point in time? Um, well, I really didn't notice because as soon as he came in and I seen the beer in his hand, I just... I just laid down and I put a sheet over my head. Why'd you do that? Because I was just, I didn't, I didn't want to argue with him. I, didn't wanna, I just, you know, I just, I was just mad. I just didn't want to talk to him. Okay. Um, why were you upset that he had to be with him that morning? I mean, because our son's not even, he was, he's just a day old. Like, in, that's not a place to. Like, who would do that, you know? Um, okay. And so you put the sheet over your head because you didn't want to deal with it. Uh, what's the next thing that you're going to happen? Um, um, 
I just I remember him calling his like his family, like his brother, and speaking with with them, telling with his nieces, telling them that he loved them, and just talking to them for a little bit, telling them, like to be good and just. I don't know. I thought he was just drunk. That's why he was like being sentimental. Like I didn't really think of, think nothing of it. Did he appear to you to be drunk or intoxicated at that time? Oh uh, yes, sir. What was it about him that made you feel like he was intoxicated? I mean, just the way he was talking. Just he was crying, talking to him. Just. You said he was crying. What else? Something. I'm sorry. He was talking to them, like just you know, just being sentimental with them. That's how he usually is sometimes. Okay, so you said that he was telling them that he loved him? Mm hmm And do you call anything else that he was telling them on the phone? Just to, for them to be good. He was When he was talking to his nieces, he was telling them, like, just to be good. And, yeah, he just told his brother he loved them and just, just pretty much stuff like that. Okay. And you felt at that time that he was just being sentimental, is that what you said? Yes, sir. Didn't think much of that? No, I didn't say. So what happens next? Um, after I guess he gets done talking to them. Um, I think I hear like the the doors like from the closets opening. Like he's like opening the closet doors, slamming them, and then next thing I know he um he like throws the like the little sliding like this that they have right there. He throws it and he like hits me in, in my head with the gun and he was like, he was telling me like just, I don't know, just, I think he told me like who's, who was here or something like that. I can't okay. remember. And so, just to kind of take this step by step, you said he began, he begins opening up the, the door of the closet, is that what you said? Yes, sir. At this point in time, was the sheet still over your head, or were you able to see what he's doing at that point? No, whenever he hit me in, in uh, my head, I took the sheet over my head, and I was like, what are you doing, you know, like, like chill. And then the first thing, I, like, I thought it was, like, because the beer has, like, spilled, and I, like, I spilled the whole beer, like, in the room, and I was, like, telling him to clean it up, you know, because, I mean, the nurses were going to come in, and I just didn't, you know, like, I don't know, I was just, you know, thinking about my son, like, they smell the beer, they're probably gonna, you know, like, get involved or something. Okay, so yeah. you mentioned that um, at this point he was, would you describe him as being angry? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Um, you had mentioned that he had thrown the table inside the room, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, is that when the beer got spilled? You mentioned some beer spilling, is that when the beer got spilled? Yes, sir. You indicated that he looked inside the closet. Did he look anywhere else inside the room that you're aware of? I think the restroom, yeah. Um, was, was there anybody else inside the room at that time? No. Okay. So you indicated that um, you had the sheet over your head and he began to hit you in the head with a gun. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you know when he had entered the hospital and specifically into your room, did he have a gun at that point? No, no, sir. Did you see where he pulled the gun from? No, no, sir. Okay. You just felt him hitting you with the gun? Yes, sir. Do you recall how many times he struck you with the gun? I think the first time was just once. Okay. Just once. Is he making any statements while this is happening? Is he saying anything to you? Um, I think he was just like saying like um, that he had told me to stop playing with him and he was just Telling me stuff like that we're gonna die today. Oh, really? Just, I mean, stuff like that. Um, okay, so you said that as he's striking you with the gun, he's making these statements. What, do you know what he is looking for when he's looking around the room? No, probably, I mean, I, I really don't. I don't know. Probably somebody. And so he made a statement saying that um, that you were gonna that y'all were gonna die that day. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did he mention if anybody else was gonna die? Uh, yes, sir. He was saying that um, whoever came walked in the room was gonna die with us, and just yeah. Did he say anything about um, people knowing about what he 
had done or what he's going to do inside the room that day? Did he mention anything about uh, being on the news? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, he was saying that we were going to make the news. And that just, yeah. He's saying that we were going to, yeah, just pretty much die and that he was going to take anybody else with whoever walked in the room and that we're going to make the news. Uh, so at this point, the sheet is off your head, is that correct? Yes, sir. Were you able to see uh, the gun at that point? Yes, sir. If you recall, can you describe what the gun looked like? Well, it was black. Yeah. Was it a small gun, medium gun, big gun? It was small. Is it the kind of gun that you hold in, inside your hand, like a handgun? Yes, sir. Okay, so he's making the statements about the guys dying and um, anybody else coming inside the room being killed. Is that correct? Can I object to leaving? <coughs> Overall. Is that correct, though, the statements he was making? Yes, sir. Okay, so what, what happens at that point? Mm. Uh, at the, I'm, I'm still trying to, like, plead with him, like, telling him to clean, like, clean the room, you know, and he was just, like, he just kept repeating himself, like, just that, from that, why was I playing with him, or just stuff like that. And then, oh, he had asked me, like, to um, to press the call button, because I guess, like, they were taking too long or something. Let's back up a little bit, Selena. Did anybody else come inside the room? Yeah, but I think that was before anything happened. Okay. Yeah. Who came inside the room? It was a. Uh, I think like a nurse, um, she had brought me some, um, some medication. Okay, was she black, white, or Hispanic? Uh, I honestly can't remember. Okay. And so the, the nurse uh, comes inside the room, and what happens when she's inside the room? Um, she, she was asked, like, she gave me the medication, and um, I was going to pay for it, so I had to ask them to if he could give me my, my bag, and um, he just threw it at me. And then I got the money, I, I paid the nurse, and then like, she just walked out, and that was it. Okay, did anybody else come inside the room a little later on? Uh, no, sir, no. So just going back to when uh, the defendant is assaulting you with the gun, he's hitting you with the gun, and he's making these statements about killing you all and killing anybody else who comes inside the room. Was the door open or closed at that time? Do you remember? It was closed. Okay. Um, and so at some point, did somebody else come inside the room while Mr. has the gun? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Who was that? Um... One of the nurses, though, she I think she was uh, supposed to come in and check on me or something. She came in and um, that's when Mr. walked up and went behind her and shot her. Okay. Uh, this person that came inside the room with just a shot, was she black, white, or Hispanic, do you recall? Oh, she was black. And so, uh, while this is all going on, where's your baby? Is your baby still in the bassinet? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. And so, kind of take us through when Nestor shoots the lady that comes inside the room. Where was he Where was he at prior to her coming inside the room? He was sitting down on the, on the side of my bed. And when she came in, he stood up and uh, just went like, around here just and then shot her. Did he say anything prior to shooting her in the head? Well, I think he says like oh uh, he was gonna use the restroom or something like that. I can't that he was gonna use the restroom. He just then he got up. Okay. So he said he was gonna go to the use the restroom and then he got up and shot him back in the head. Yes, sir. Was uh, the lady who he shot, was she doing anything at that point in time? What was she doing when she was shot in the back of the head? She was looking at her clipboard. She was just, like looking for something on in her clipboard. clipboard. Okay. 
Was she paying any attention to Nestor? No. Did she say anything to him? Uh, no, sir. Did she make any kind of threats towards him? Oh, no. Did no, she sir. assault him in any way? No, sir. How close was the defendant to uh, the social worker when he shot her in the back of the head? I mean, like, right, right behind her. Just real close. And how many times did he fire? Once. What are your thoughts at that point? What's going through your mind? I, I'm still in shock. I can't believe it. I'm like, I don't know, I'm scared because now I actually believe him that he's going to kill me and, you know, and him in front of our son. So what does he do after he shoots the social worker? Um, he goes like on the side of me and uh, he pulls out his, the bullets from behind his back pocket or something and uh, reloads. He starts putting more bullets in his gun. Okay. And then, so you say he pulls the bullets out of his pocket? Yes, sir. You know which pocket he pulled it out of? Oh, no, sir. Okay. And he starts to reload the gun, is that what you said? Yes, sir. Is he making any statements at that time? Yeah, um, he was, I mean, he was just telling me to enjoy the uh, the time I had with my son. Um, I mean, yeah, he was just saying that he told me, he's like, yeah, that we were going to die. He told you you were going to die today? Mm -hmm. Did he ask you to do anything at that point, either uh, at the point in time that he reloaded the gun or after he reloaded the gun? No, sir. Okay. Um, you had said earlier that he had uh, asked you to bring in another somebody else inside the room? That was, no, that was before, like, he had shot anybody. Okay. He, like, I guess they were taking too long. It's like somebody to come in or whatever. He was waiting. And he was, he, he had told me, like, to press the call button. So somebody could come in. <coughs> and so what did he do after he wrote the gun? Um, he started walking to the door. And um, I guess the door was closed and he opened it and went inside. I mean, went outside and was, um, I guess was going to, I don't know. But then he got shot, I think, and then he came back inside. As he reloads the gun, he said, went to the door, opened the door, and started to walk out. Does he say anything at that point? Um, no, so I just remember hearing the um, the gun go off again. Okay. Uh, did you see him fire any other shots? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Um, describe that for us. How many additional shots did you see him fire after he shot the social one? Uh, I think it was once more. Okay. And where did he fire towards? Did you see that? No, so it was just outside. Was okay. Could you see outside the door from where you were? Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Okay. Could you see anybody inside the hallway at that point with the fires? No, sir. I just seen <coughs> the back of him. Like, he was kind of covering the, the door. Okay. And so he, you mentioned that he got shot as well. How did you know that he got shot? Because he came back out and he was like, there was, he was like, I guess, he was in pain. He was like, I guess, bleeding too. Okay. Prior to getting shot, you said that he opened the door and then he fired the shot. Do you remember about how much time between when he opened the door and when he fired? Mm -hmm. No, sir. No, I don't know. Right. So he fires outside the door, he gets shot. Um, and then he comes back inside the room. What happens after he gets shot and comes back inside the room? Um, he comes like on on the side, like in the corner, and um, oh, by then I already had my baby in my hands, and he was like trying to take him away. And um, was the baby awake at that point? No, he was still asleep. The baby was still sleeping. Mm -hmm. And you said that he was trying to take the baby away from you. Describe what he was doing. He was like trying to get him so he could like, I guess, shoot me. 
Did he stay out the gun in his hand at that point? Yes, sir. Okay. What was he doing with the gun? He was trying. He was trying to point it at me. Okay. Did he hit you with it at that point? Um. No, sir. He had hit me again when everybody pressed the call button. Talk about that for us. You said he hit you when you didn't press the call button. Tell us about that. Yeah, because uh, when they were taking too long, um, he told me like to press the call button, and I, I didn't want to, so he like, stood up, and he called me a bitch, and uh, he hit me, like I think it was like two more times. Why didn't you want to press the call button? Because, uh, I mean, I just didn't want to. like. Um, when he asked you to press the call button, did he have a gun in his hand at that point? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Do you call uh, specifically where you got the shoot in the head with the gun, Selena? Uh, yeah, I think it was um, my left. The first time it was my left side. And then I think the second time it was like, it was like both sides, I think. On both sides of your head, the left and the right. Mm -hmm. Did you have any? Uh, did you feel pain when he hit you with the gun in your head? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. And did you have some visible injuries on your head from him striking you with the gun? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Permission to approach the witness, Sean. You may. <coughs> I'm going to show you what's been marked at his state's exhibits three. Through 11. Can you tell me how these photographs of how you looked in the hospital that day after this incident? States exhibits three through 11 accurately depict how you looked on October 22nd, 2002, and also accurately uh, depict the injuries that you sustained from the assault by Mr. Hernandez. Yes, sir. This time the state's going to offer state exhibits number three through 11. Can you counsel? In the front, like, um. Technician is putting up a ruler 
showing the size of the injury. And we see a little bit of a closer uh, viewpoint of that injury. Is that correct, Selena? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall, were you bleeding at the time? Do you remember? Mm, no, sir. Mm -hmm. okay. well, we clearly see yeah. a visible uh, injury there, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. State exhibit number seven, again, showing more towards the back of the left side of the witness's uh, face and neck area. State exhibit number eight, just a closer viewpoint of that same area. Can you stand up one more time so they can show on the photograph where you were injured? Um, yeah, just like over there, right there. Okay. And for the record, she's pointing at an area of redness um, towards the back of the left ear on the lower neck area. <coughs> State exhibit number nine, again, uh, <coughs> in the same area, but just showing. Uh, the ruler measurement there of the injury appears to be approximately three inches from top to bottom. State exhibit number 10, uh, same area, just showing uh, the measurement towards the bottom of the injury, again, approximately three inches. And then state exhibit number 11, uh, we see the right side of your face. Is that correct, Selena? Yes, sir. Okay, if you could stand one more time and just show us where the defendant struck you on the right side of your head. You're going to talk. Okay, is it, um, is it more like behind your hairline or is it more on the skin of your face? When no, you it's like, like behind your hair. <coughs> where your hair? Um, yeah, behind your hair. Okay, so Selena, uh, you mentioned that the defendant is shot at that point. Um, you said you pick up your baby, you have the baby in your arms, correct? Yes, sir. And you said he's trying to take the baby from you? Yes, sir. Okay. What happens at that point? Is he able to get the baby from you? No, sir. Okay, what happens? Take us from that point forward. What happens next? Um, he... I was talking to him, telling him like to pretty much just like to give me the gun to look at our serve. And um to like just calm down and like I guess like turn himself in. Okay. And did he make any further uh statements or did he make any phone calls after that point? I think his his mom had called him, um, and he he was talking to her and uh, told her what what had happened. And did you call what he was saying to his mother on the phone? Um, he just told her that he had shot somebody. Did you call if he was speaking in English or Spanish? Uh, Spanish. So he told his mom and father that he had shot somebody. Yes, sir. Did he say whether or not that, that person was still alive? Uh, no, sir. I can't recall. Okay. All right. So you recall what, where was he when he was making his phone call? Was he still up? Was he down on the floor? Where was he at? He was still on um, my right side, like in the corner, talking to her. Okay. So what happens next after he has this conversation with his mother? Um, she's trying to talk to him, and um, I'm trying to talk to him. What are you telling him? Um, just to calm down, just um, to throw the gun outside. At this point, could you hear anybody else from outside the room speaking or talking? Oh uh, yes, sir. One of the um, Methodist police, I guess, one of the officers there. Were they giving any kind of orders or commands to either yourself or to the defendant? Uh, yes, sir. They were um, telling him like to to throw the gun outside too, and to uh, to let us out. Okay. The minister still has a gun at that point. Oh um, yes, sir. Um, and you still have the baby in your arms, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. 
at some point you have to lose or the defendant lose possession of the gun? Do you lose control of the gun at some point? Oh uh, yes, sir. Tell us um, about that. What happened with the gun? After um, I was talking to him, telling he kind of like he was about to throw it outside, and he I, well I guess he was walking towards the door, and um, he fell and threw the gun. And when he threw it, I jumped, I jumped up and I grabbed it. And you said he threw it. Can you describe it for us? Did he, did he purposely throw it? Did he drop it? What happened with it? Yeah, he, uh, I guess because he was bleeding, he fell over and he, he dropped the gun. Like, so I got up and I uh, yeah. went to go get it. What and was the gun? I'm sorry, I didn't touch it. I'm going to. Um, it was like, I think, on the last minute yeah. or something. I can't remember. So was it on the floor, the gun, or was it, you say it was by the bassinet? Yeah. Was it on the floor? Yes, sir. Okay. And so what did you do? Uh, I, I jumped up and I went to go grab it, and I threw it outside. Okay. What was, next, what was the defendant doing while you were grabbing the gun? He was on the floor. What did you do with the baby? I still had him in my hand. Did you still have the baby when you picked up the gun? Yes, sir. Okay. And what did you do with the gun when you picked it up? I threw it outside. Um, so what did you do after you took the gun outside? Did you say anything to the officers that were on top of you? Yeah, I told them to, uh, for them to come. Okay, cool. But we'll um, figure it out. To get my baby. But I was telling them, like, because I was scared they were going to shoot in the room, so I was telling them not to shoot him because I didn't want him to die either. Okay. Why did you feel like that? Why did you feel like you didn't want the I mean, that was, that was uh, just too much. I had already seen, you know. Just that's, that was my baby daddy. That's, you know. I still had my son and I just didn't, I didn't want them to kill him either. And when you said <clears throat> you'd already seen too much, what do you mean? I mean, him killed that lady in front of me. Like, I mean, the nurse in front of me. Like, he was, it was too much blood, I just, it was already a lot going on, you know? So, while, um, let's kind of back up a little bit. When he shot the nurse in the back of the head inside the room, was she, was she still there inside the room the whole time? Yes, sir, she, uh, she was on the floor. Okay. And going back prior to when he was shot by the police officer, when he opens the door, where is the body of the social worker at the point? Um, she, she was kind of like, um, she was, she, I guess she was like by the door and he couldn't open it. So he like, he like forcefully, you know, opened the door with her, like, so like to move her on the side, uh, like on the side and stuff. Okay. So when he was trying to open the door, he couldn't open the door because the body was there. So he had to move her body with the door. Mm, yes, sir. Did you realize that um, when he shot outside of the door, after he shot the social worker the first time, he went back to the door and he shot outside the door. Did you realize that he had shot somebody else at that point or did you not know that at that point? No, sir, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't. Okay. And so um, you took the gun outside the room, you tell the officers, hey, out. the gun's no longer in here. Um, you're telling them not to shoot him. What happens at that point? Um, they they come in and I gave him my baby. I told him like to help me because I was still I still couldn't get out the room because I was like I guess like plugged in and stuff. I couldn't leave, so I gave one of the officers my son and they grabbed Nestor. Where was Nestor at when the officers entered the room? Um, in front of the bed, like. On the floor for by the bed. Okay. Was he upright or was he laying down? He was still. He was laying down. Okay. Do you recall Nestor making any statements at that point? Was he saying anything when the officers made entry into the room? No, sir. I don't. I really wasn't worried about him at at the time. I was worried about my son. Okay. Um, were you still holding your son at that time? Uh, I gave him to another to an officer. When the officers came in, you were still holding the baby, though, correct? Oh, yes, sir. How was your baby? Was your baby injured at all? Yes, sir. 
So the officers took the defendant outside the room. Did you see the defendant at any point after that? No, sir. Did you have to have any kind of treatment for your injuries? <coughs> no, sir. So at some point, um, you all went through a process with the baby and you got some paternity test results, is that correct? Yes, sir. What were the results of the paternity test? That he's the father. At this time, you're on pursuant to a stipulation with the defense. The state's going to offer statement number 12, which is a DNA test report from DNA Diagnostic Center. Objection. Objection. All right, state's exhibit number 12 is admitted for all purposes. Permission to the jury. You may. Thank you, Your Honor. Permission to summarize for the jury, Your Honor. DNA. Case number 12 is again a DNA test report from the DNA Diagnostic Center showing that uh, the defendant, Mr. Nestor Hernandez, is 99.99997% uh, probably with paternity for the child, Jade Sanchez. Um, let me ask you this, Selena. Um, just in full transparency, you have been uh, convicted of a couple of felonies, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. You have been convicted of burglary of a habitation back in 2015, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you were sentenced to three years in prison, is that right? Uh, I think 2015, I think that's the aggravated robbery. Okay, looks like you were sentenced to three years in prison for burglary of a habitation in September 2015. You're also, as you mentioned, convicted of aggravated robbery here in Dallas in 2015 as well. And you were sentenced to five years in prison, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, given that, have you told the truth to the jury today? Yes, sir. Does any of your criminal history have any bearing on what the defendant did that day? No, no sir. And have you been totally honest and transparent with the jury about the actions that the defendant took place? Yes. At Methodist Hospital on October 22nd, 2022. Yes, sir. Thanks for the Thank you. Ms. Milko, I have a few questions for you, ma'am, if I might. Uh, in regards to the relationship that you and Nestor had about going up to the period right before this incident at the hospital, uh, there was a lot of issues between you and him in regards to whether or not this baby was actually his. Is that not correct? No, not really. You don't recall him telling you that he wasn't sure that this baby was his? In the beginning, but he was, he knew. He just, he knew. Well, I mean, but that was what was, that's what was leading up to the point in time when you ended up going to the hospital with Nestor, correct? What do you mean? I mean, there had been some discussions about that prior to the time that he took you to the hospital for you to give birth. No. Okay. Now, in regard to this gun, uh, you said that you weren't aware that he had uh, had a gun uh, when he came to the hospital that day. Is that right? Yeah, I didn't know he had it on him. Okay. Uh, you had seen the gun before, had you not? Yes, sir. And in fact, uh, you had seen it the day before when you all were on the way to the hospital, didn't you? Oh, yes, sir. Did you have a discussion with Nestor the day that you were going to the hospital regarding whether or not you were going to give the baby his last name? Yes, sir. And did you tell Nestor that if he would get rid of that gun, that you would take that you would give the baby his last name? Yes, sir. Okay. And so, uh, at that point in time, did Nestor not put the gun in your bag so that no. he would not have it? No. He didn't give you. The, he didn't put the gun in your bag so that you because he promised him that if you, if he would give it up, that uh, you would give the baby his last name. No, he put it on the side of the inside the his car, the the truck he was driving. Okay. So your testimony is you didn't know that you didn't see that gun at all in the hospital before he was saying he just pulled it out of his pocket. Yeah, I, he left it in the truck. He when when we went in, he had uh, put it like on the 
like on the side of the door. I can't remember where. Um, but mm -hmm. he didn't. He didn't give me nothing. Like he knew I'm. I'm, I'm having my son. I, I don't play with him. Like none of that. That's why I didn't want him to have the gun. Well, think about it just for a minute. You you said two different things. You said one, he put it in the side of the car. Then you said he put it in the door of the car. Yeah, inside, like the door. Like he would, he had like a little thing that he would put it inside. I don't know, like a little hiding spot, I guess. Okay, so he didn't put it in the trunk of the car. No. Do you recall having a conversation being interviewed by these two folks right here? on September the 25th of this year? Yes, sir. Do you remember telling those two folks when they interviewed you? You saw they were taking notes when they were talking to you, correct? Yes, sir. You don't recall telling them that uh, you uh, thought he put it in the trunk of the car? Not in the trunk. Okay. So, now, the day before this all occurred, you and him had, he had taken you to the hospital, correct? Yes, sir. But you didn't want him to take you to the hospital, did you? Mm, no. Well, he was the father of your baby. Yes, sir. You're telling this jury <clears throat> that you guys weren't arguing, but you didn't want the father of your baby to take you to the hospital? Yeah, because that, that day he, we were just... Okay, you said the day that he, the, the, he took you to the hospital the day before the baby was born, correct? Uh, yes, sir. All right. And you said that he was happy and excited at that point. Oh, uh, yes, sir. And you gave him an ultimatum about this, this gun that he had and told him that unless he gave up the gun, you weren't going to give the baby his last name. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So on the day that all this came, this started uh, on the 22nd, when he came back to the hospital that day, you said that when he came into the room, you said he was carrying a beer and that you got mad at him and you immediately pulled the blanket up over your head. Hey, yes, sir. You wouldn't even talk to me, would you? No, sir. Okay. Was there some discussion at that time regarding whether or not you had possibly or potentially given him a venereal disease? <laughs> was there was there in fact an argument at that time leading up to this about two things? You're cheating on him, and you're giving him potentially a venereal disease. No, sir. We didn't. Even, we didn't even talk at all. Well, but you, your so your testimony is that he just came in there and he's just uncontrollably out of his mind for no reason when he had been happy and excited about the birth of this baby the day before. And that morning. Yeah, and so that morning he calls you and says, "Hey, I'm thinking about getting a haircut before I come, so we can have some family pictures made." Yes, sir. But then he shows up at the room, and when he walks in the room, you immediately pull the blanket over your head, and you refuse to talk to him, don't you? Um, yes, sir, because he, he brought a, a beer inside while we, when we just had our son. Like, who would do that? Well, okay, but it's just, I mean, it's a beer in a hospital room. It's not the end of the world. Are you? Yes, sir. I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to find <laughs> out that you're saying that all of a sudden, uh, he came in and he's mad for no reason whatsoever. That's him. <clears throat> now, when this was taking place, were, how how long were you laying in the bed? No, what do you mean? In the hospital bed. How, at what point did you get up out of the hospital bed? I, I didn't get up till after all that happened. Did you not get up and when he started to look around into the and look into the bathroom prior to the nurse coming into the room? No. You never stood up. No, I couldn't even if if I had to stand up, I had to have a nurse with me because I was plugged in like to this one thing. Like I couldn't, I couldn't get up. Okay. And did you have the baby in your arms at this time, or was the baby in a bassinet? The whole time before that happened, he was on the bassinet. Okay. When did you get the baby out and have the baby in your arms? When he was walking like towards my son, and I didn't want him to get him. Okay. When was that in this whole in this whole scenario that you described? Was it prior to the? Okay. There had before been, he shot. Okay. Let me back up just a moment. There had been another nurse came into the room while you and Nestor were there, while you had the blanket pulled up over your head. She came in and gave you some medication, did she not? Yes, sir. 
Okay. How soon was that before this argument escalated? Um, I mean, because he, he, right after she left, I think she had, he had got on the phone. That's when he got on the phone with his family. He was on the phone for a little bit, so. Okay. Now, so at this point in time, you're saying you've got the blanket pulled over your head. He's trying to talk to you. You refuse to talk to him. He wasn't trying to talk to me. Since he walked in, the, the only thing he said as soon as he walked in, he was like, oh, our, you know, he's asleep talk, talking about our son. And then he just went um, and sat down on the, on the side of, by the bed. He went and sat down on the side by the bed? Mm -hmm. Did he try to pick up the baby? No, he was asleep. He just, no, he didn't try. Okay. I'm trying to figure out, uh, Ms. Villatore, if you can explain to this jury what was that triggered this whole situation to escalate, if hey, you know. That's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out the same thing. Why did he do that? Because so we were good th in the morning. We were good. Like, he was happy. He, I was I, I was texting him the whole time, telling him that the lady from the, uh, that morning, the lady for the, I guess, the social security, you know, the social security thing uh, had came in. It was like, she was also asking me, like, for his last name, and I didn't know, and, uh, I was texting him, telling him that I need we needed his ID and stuff. Like, like we were good. Well, we I don't know why he did this. Like for no reason, he. Right. So you you don't you don't recall that there was any conversation that actually started this whole situation that got no you mad and him mad. Yeah, he came. I don't know why, how or was he if he was even mad. I just remember. Seen the beer and I thought already like he was drunk like, like that's the only thing that was. Why would you? Mind. Why would you immediately come to that assumption? I mean, just because he drinks a lot. Like when he drinks, he he doesn't just like sip. He chugs like he be he be drinking. But you said that you immediately came to that assumption before you really even took time to speak with him or talk to him, didn't you? I mean. I kind of knew, like, when I, I seen the beer, because he had to, he had took long to, like, come to the hospital. When I seen the beer, I, like, I, I already knew he, was, he had been drinking. Now, Ms. Miltor, at the time that your testimony that the, uh, uh, the nurse came in, uh, did you, were you, in the fact, not laying there with the blanket over your head at that time? When one nurse? When the nurse came in, the second nurse came in that morning. The one that he shot? Or the one that was shot, yes ma'am. No sir. You didn't have the blanket over your head at that time? No sir. What were you doing as far as trying to, uh, now you're telling, you told the jury at this point in time you're concerned that he might do something to somebody, is that right? Oh well, yeah. I was just, I kind of like, I don't know, I didn't think he was, he would do anything that dumb, like. So what, and, and so, your testimony to this jury was that he just walked up behind her. Is that correct? Oh yes, sir. Did he? Did he not, in fact, strike you and hit you while this nurse was in the room? No, sir. He didn't hit you with that gun with it while the nurse was in the room. No, sir. So it's your testimony that he just shoots her for no reason, and then. He comes back and did, when the witness in this situation did you say that he reloaded that weapon? As soon as he shot her. So he shot her and then reloaded the weapon. Yes, sir. So one bullet was shot and then he took. You say he took the time to reload his gun at that point. He just. I just. I don't know if he was like reloaded, but I just remember him. Like I don't know how how many bullets he had in his thing or whatever, but I just remember him pulling out his bullets from behind and just. Putting some more bullets in in his um, in his gun. All right. Now, are you? You're telling this jury that you were still laying in the bed at this point in time. I was still laying. I couldn't. I couldn't get off the bed. Like. Well, you could get off the bed because I believe we're going to see some videos in a few moments where you were up standing outside the bed yelling and screaming. Is that not correct? After after he dropped the gun and I jumped up. Okay. Well, that's what I want to ask you then. How was it that you were able to jump up at that point in time while you were still hooked up? I was hooked up, but I jumped up and I grabbed the gun and- What did you do when you I grabbed threw, the gun? I threw it like I had to, cause I was 
there was like a needle, I guess, uh, what are the, something in, in, in my arm, so I had to like slide the gun outside, like. Yeah, you had to slide the gun outside. I just put it on the floor and I slid it. Like, okay. Now, and did it slide out from underneath the door? The door was open. So your testimony is that the door was open at this point in time? Yeah, after he shot him. Yeah. Okay. Now, so are you sure that you're, did you not have to open that door? Pull it open to throw the gun out? No, the door was closed. I mean, the door was open. Okay. So when the, when you say that Nestor went over and opened the door, you heard a gunshot. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Could you you could you see anything outside of that door? I just seen I was I had seen him. Do you have any idea what Nestor saw when he opened the door? No. All you did is all you heard a gunshot, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, when you testified a little bit earlier, you told Miss Jury that at the time that uh, you grabbed the gun and threw it out of the door, that uh, you had the baby in your arms. You recall testifying to that earlier? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm still trying to figure out at what point in time did you pick up the baby? You haven't described ever picking up the baby since I've spoken to you. You, <coughs> you told me he was in the bassinet. Yeah, he was in, in the bassinet, but after he hit me, he, like the first time he walked around, it was walking towards the bassinet, and that's when I picked him up. Okay. And this was before anything happened in the, else happened in that room? Yes, sir. Right. So when you got out and you took the gun, you said you picked up the gun by the bassinet and you threw it out the door of the room? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> And it was it, and then at that point in time, you said that Nestor left the room one more time, and when he came back in, he'd been shot. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Did you know what had happened outside of that room, or was there any way for you to have possibly done? I just heard the gun. I didn't. I didn't know he had shot somebody else. I just remember, like he came in and I seen the blood, and I I kind of figured. It was him who I got shot, but I didn't know somebody else had got shot. All right, and, when, and did did Nestor tell you he had shot him? Did Nestor even know someone else had been shot? Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to object to speculations. He has no idea what was in the mind of the defendant. I'll rephrase. Did Nestor make any statements to you that he had opened that door and shot somebody else? No, sir. <clears throat> when he talked to his mother, he and, and you were listening to that phone conversation, correct? Yes, that phone sir. conversation was taking place in Spanish? Uh, yes, sir. And you were you speak Spanish? Yes, sir. And you were able to understand the words that were being spoken between the defendant and his mother, correct? Yes, sir. And at that point in time, he told him that he'd shot one person, didn't he? Yes, sir. He didn't. He, he wasn't even aware from the conversation that you overheard that there had been two people shot. Was it? Jack, speculation again. So you can't. If you know, what was in his head? Sustained. Was there anything about that conversation, ma'am, that would have led you to believe? that Nestor had knowledge that he had in fact shot two people? No, sir. And from your vantage point, you have no idea what Nestor was able to see or observe when he opened the door that second time? No, sir. The, uh, each time you talked about Nestor going to the door, you said Nestor opened the door. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yes, what was it that caused that door to remain open after the uh, Nestor went out the second time and was shot? You said he went over and opened the door and walked out and came back in and he was shot. Yeah, I think I think it was like the way the nurse was at, like the way she was on the floor. I think that's. I just remember it, it, it being open. I didn't really pay. I don't well, know why. Well, in fact, know. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. In fact, you told this jury earlier that uh, Nestor had moved the uh, body of the nurse so that he could that he could open the door again. You don't recall testifying to that? Whenever he was trying to first, whenever he tried to open the door, she was on the way. So he like with the door, he slid her like you know like on the side. He didn't move her nowhere. So he, she was still like right behind the door. You know, like. Well, then how was it you were able to throw the handgun out the door if the nurse was in the way? Because I reached, like, all the way as much as I could, and I just threw it. I just slid in, like. 
And it's your testimony that at that point, Mister's laying on the ground, he's bleeding, and uh, you're hollering to the police, and the police come in and secure the scene. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And there's no question that when you heard Nestor Hernandez speaking to his mother on the phone, from that conversation, he had only indicated that he knew he had shot one person. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's all I had, Your This had, for this time. All right. State, just briefly, Your Honor. Go ahead. So, when the Duke indicated that, um, so the defense attorney asked you about <clears throat> your interview with us prior to trial. He talks about the gun inside the truck. <clears throat> and he says that you said something about putting the gun in the trunk, but isn't it true that you told us that the gun was inside the truck at that time? Yeah, it was inside, yeah. Okay, and you also testified on cross with the defense attorney that you were not able to get off the bed. You're describing all this hectic uh, activity that's taking place inside the room with, by the defendant, but you're not able to get up off the bed. Why is that? I mean, like, why couldn't I get off the bed? Why couldn't you get off the bed? I mean, I just, I just couldn't. I, I just couldn't. I was stuck to like the this one, like with a syringe or something. I just had it. I couldn't. I don't know. And then I had C, a C-section, so it was just. I was barely. They were barely showing me how to like move around and stuff. So I really didn't even know how to like. No, I just, I just couldn't. Okay, so you say you had a C-section, right? Mm -hmm. Were you in any pain on that day from having a C-section the day before? No, yes, sir. Yes, okay. yeah. So you were in pain during this whole ordeal? No, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and you had also indicated that you were attached to some machinery, some hospital machines? Oh, yes, sir. You said a syringe, but is it more like an, an IV? Like yeah, a like an IV. Yeah, a line. For medication and things of that sort? Yes, sir. Okay, um, and going back to our interview prior to trial, um, you testified that you weren't quite sure how much time took place between when the defendant went back to the door to shoot after he had shot the social worker. He went to the door, opened the door, and fired again. Um, do you recall telling us that you that as soon as he opened the door, he pretty much fired immediately after opening the door? Yes, sir. Were you afraid that the defendant was going to kill you that day? Oh yeah. Were yeah. you afraid that he was going to kill or harm your baby? Oh. I didn't think he was gonna harm him, but mo like mostly me. Like, I don't think his intentions was to um, kill our son, but just me and him. Is that why he was trying to get the baby from you? Do you think because he was trying to kill you? Yes, sir. Yeah. Were you afraid that he may try to kill somebody else that was not inside the room? Oh uh, yes, sir. Yeah. What gave you that impression that he may want to hurt somebody else? I mean, just. Somebody else? Because he reloaded, he was trying to go back outside too. That's all I have, Jess. Thank you. Right. Absolutely. I have no further questions this time, Ron. All right, may this one has been released? What's that, Sean? Uh, it's up to Rico. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Leah Toro. You are free to step down at this point, but please remain. Um, within earshot in case either party wants to recall you, okay? okay. All right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, would you all like a short break at this time? 15 minute break? Okay. All right, let's be back at...
All rise. Leonardo Lopez, L E O N A R D O. L O P E Z. Yes. Okay, what do you do for a living? I'm a torture driver. Torture driver? Okay, and how long have you been doing that? About, about a year. Okay. And so, uh, you didn't necessarily want to be in court today, did you? No. Let's be honest, you don't want to be there, right? No. Okay, so we asked you to be here and you're going to tell the truth to the jury, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, are you married, Leonardo? No. Okay. Do you have a significant other? Yes. Okay. What's her name? Noemi. What's her last name? Davila. Can you spell that for the court reporter? D A V I L A. Spell her first name, please. N O E M Y. And is she uh, in court today with you for support? Yes. Okay. And you have a child together? Yes. How many children do you have? One. And how old is your uh, child? She just turned one. What's her <coughs> name? Elsie. How's your baby doing? Doing good. Okay. Leonardo, let me take you back to the date of October the 22nd, 2022. Uh, were you at Methodist Hospital that day uh, because Naomi had just given birth to your child? Yes. Okay. And on that particular day, did you happen to come into contact with this defendant, Lester Hernandez? Yes. <coughs> Can you tell us about that contact? How did you first come into contact with the defendant? Uh, I was right there in the room. He walks in and he realized it was the wrong room. It was quick, in and out. He just walked away. Did he have anything either in his hands or with him when he came into your room? Uh, I think he had a, a beverage. Okay, you saw what kind of beverage it was? Can you tell what it was? I don't. <clears throat> what did it look like? Like a can. Okay, remember what color it was or anything like that? Mm, maybe black. Okay. And the person that came into your room, do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes. Okay. If I'm seated in seat number one, my co counsel in seat number two, and on down the line, what seat number would you be in? Number five. Okay, the record reflects this witness has identified the defendant on the court. The record will show us that. Thank you, Your Honor. And so you said he came into the room, and it was pretty quick, but just kind of describe what happened when he came into the room. You said that he mistook um, that for his room, is that correct? The what? You say that he was mistaken about that being his room? Yeah, well, I guess he said he came to see her, and he realized that it wasn't her. He walked out. Okay, when you say he came to see her, who was he referring to? My, uh, Noemi. Okay, so uh, if I understand you correctly, he believed that Noemi, the mother of your child, was his girl. Yes. Okay. Did he appear, how was his demeanor to you? Did he seem normal, or did he seem other than normal? Well, it was pretty quick. He just walked in and walked right back out. Okay. 
Um, did he tell you, did you ask him any questions? Uh, then I said, who are you? And so what did he say? He said his name. What did he say his name was? Nestor. Okay. Um, and again, I know it was quick, but did you recall anything specifically about the way he was acting? Did he appear strange to you? Not really, it was just quick. Okay, do you recall having an interview with a, a Dallas Police Department detective at the hospital that day? Yes. Do you recall telling him that he was referring to the defendant really hyped up? Do you remember that? Yes. Do you remember listening to that audio when you spoke with myself and my co-counsel? Yes. The trial? Yes? Yes. Which statements? The statements with regard to the defendant's demeanor. I don't know what that means. About how he was acting that day. If I'm saying what? Judge, if I may, um, if I could play the, the, the witness's audio for him outside the presence of the jury to refresh his recollection as to what he was said about the defendant's demeanor that day. If he's okay. saying he doesn't recall. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, how long is it going to take? The audio is only about 60 minutes, but it's probably a one minute, uh, a one minute clip of the, of the audio. All right, um, I'm going to give you another five minute break. All right. <clears throat>
that we're ready to talk about public elections. Yes. And over the course of that break, we had the opportunity to listen to a portion of the audio interview that you gave Little Child Police Department on October the 22nd, 2022 at Methodist Hospital, correct? Yes. After uh, listening to that audio, did that refresh your recollection as to um, how you described that the defendant was acting that day? Yes. Can you tell us how he was acting? He looked really confident, really like confident. And um, anything else that you heard in that audio as it pertains specifically <coughs> to um, the way he was acting? Mm, just confident, really. As far as any drugs or alcohol? Uh, well, he looked a little abnormal, I guess you could say. Okay, did you say that it seemed like he was high? That's what I said, yeah. Okay. I'll pass it to Sean. No questions? Thanks, sir.
introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling it for the court reporter. Stacy Smith, S T A C E Y Smith, S M I T H. Hey, Ms. Smith, how are you employed? How am I employed? Yes. Oh, um, I was with uh, Methodist Medical Center. Okay, what do you do now? I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. And how long have you been doing that? I've been doing that for about three years. Before that, I was a registered nurse with Methodist for 20, almost 21 years. And so uh, you said that you were a registered nurse with Methodist for 21 years. Almost um, 21. Okay, almost 21 years. Were you working there in that capacity on October the 22nd, 2022? Yes. So let me take you back to that date, October the 22nd of 2022. Uh, what, were your, what was your role with Methodist at that time? Um, I was a staff nurse. Uh, that On that day, I was uh, serving as a charge nurse. Okay. And what is uh, the duties of a charge nurse? What does that mean for the jury? Uh, you just kind of oversee the unit. Uh, if anyone needs assistance with patients or anything, they'll come in. You're a resource for like anyone to help with the patients. You do staffing. Uh, you make assignments for new patients coming to the unit and just like make sure things are running smoothly. So would you consider that to be sort of like a supervisory role for the other nurses? For that day, yes, you are the supervisor. And on that particular day, do you recall how many patients were in the unit at that time? And, and let me just clarify for the record, what particular unit were you working in that day? I was on the mother baby unit and it was four shingle tower. And when you say four, is that uh, referring to the fourth floor? To the floor? fourth floor. And for the record, can you spell shingle for the fourth floor? S H S C H E I N K E L, something like that. Do you recall um, how many patients were on the unit at that time, on that day? Yes, there were. About 24, 23 or 24 patients that day. And um, how many of those, does that include mothers and babies? That's including mothers and babies. Does that take into account other visitors that may have been there? Like no. Like family or friends? Or no. Visitors? That's only the patients. Okay. So there could have been additional folks. Oh, there were additional people. Okay. Do you remember... Um, I know it's not an exact number, but do you recall how many people were in? Would it be, seem like to be full at that time? Uh, we were probably about four rooms short of being full. And do you know what the capacity is as far as how many people? We have, we have 26, I believe we could hold 26 uh, patients, room as far as mothers, but babies, we could just keep going until. Okay, so the max was about 26, and you said on this particular day it was 23 to 24 patients. So well, actually, there's 26 rooms, but moms are counted separately from babies, so there's 26 plus 26, so it'll be like 52. Okay, okay. okay. and uh, do you know either of the victims in this case, Katie Flowers or Jacqueline Sapu? I do. Okay, do you know them both? Or? Yes. How long had you known uh, Katie? I knew her for, if she, I think she had been there 12 years. I knew her all 12 years. How do you describe your relationship with her? Uh, we were friends. Like, we were co-workers, and we were also friends. Like, we share things about, you know, our families, our friends, our loved ones. We share the events of our lives and things. So, how about Jacqueline? How long did you know her? I knew Jacqueline probably that happened in October. So probably for the last like four months for sure I knew her. Okay. So on that, on that particular day at approximately eleven AM, do you recall something unusual happening in the in the unit that day? Yes. Tell us what happened. Um I went to a patient that was being discharged, I went to make charge nurse rounds. Uh, 
before they were discharged. So I can come back and put their comments in the computer because once they're discharged, you can't do it. But I left my cell phone and the charge nurse phone on the desk. And when I got into the patient's room, I was walking by and I saw the officer standing outside of room three. And I just asked him, hey, is everything okay? He said, yes, it was fine. So I kept going. I'm going to cut you off and let me slow you down just a little bit. You referred to an officer that you saw outside of room three? Yes. Do you recall what agency that officer was with? He was with the Methodist. Okay. Do you know that officer's name? I know it now, Officer uh, Rangel. And so was that unusual? It was unusual because we don't usually have officers. Like they'll make rounds, like just walk through, but he was standing outside of room three. So you asked him, is everything okay? And his response was what? Yeah, everything is fine. And he was like looking through like a little notebook. Okay. And so what did you do from there? I kept going to room to the room I was going to uh, make the discharge round on. And um, when I got into the room, I was closing the door and I heard a pop. And I told uh, the patient who I was running, and I said, oh, I think that's one of the caution wet floor signs, it sounds like it may have fallen over. And as I'm closing the door, I start hearing like screams. So then. Okay, hold on one second, Ms. Bill. Um, so going back to the patient room that you were in at the time, how many people were in that room? Well, at the time, when I walked in, I thought it was just her, but the father of her baby was, also, was in the bathroom. I didn't know that then. Was the baby inside the room at that time? No, the baby was in NICU. Yes. Okay. And at that point in time, you did not realize that this was a gunshot? No. You thought that it was, you said, uh, I thought it was like the caution wet floor, when it falls over and makes a pop, I thought that that fell over. Okay. And so immediately after that, you said that you heard screams, is that correct? I, heard, I started to hear scream. And describe for the jury what you heard? I just heard like, like someone screaming, ah, stop it, stop it or something to that effect. And then that's when I walked out of the room trying to see what was going on because when I heard the scream, I didn't know why this person was screaming, but I could hear like in the direction of where the scream was coming from. The voice that you heard, did it sound like a, a female voice or a male voice? It sounded like a female. Okay, so you testified just now that it was something along the lines of stop it or something like that? Yeah. And so you come out into the hallway, and what do you see? When I come out of the hallway, I see the uh, him. I see him standing in the doorway, like the door to room six is closed, like part, just about closed, only about that much open. He's standing in the doorway, and he's standing out there, and he's pointing a gun out like this, and he's just like looking and just shooting. Okay, so you referred to room number six. Is that where the individual that you saw shooting was located? That's where I saw him at. Okay, and you were in, in room what at that time? I was in room 11, so nine and 11 are here. No, I'm coming out of room 11, but nine and 11 are here. Five and seven are here, and he's shooting out between like five and seven. And so the individual that you saw that was shooting, did you get a good look enough, a good enough look at that person to identify that person? Yes. Did you see that person in court today? Yes. If I'm seated in seat number one, my co counsel is seat number two, all the way down the line, what seat would he be? Five. Located? I mean, the record reflects that we can start identifying these three open court. The record will show us black. Thank you. <coughs> And so you indicated that you saw the individual with the gun pointed out and firing, is that correct? Yes. Uh, how many times, if you recall, did, did you see him fire? Twice. Did you see anybody else in the hallway at that time? Annette. Where was she in relation to where the shooter was located? Annette was like in the hallway by like room five and seven but standing on that side of the hallway and he was over like right like as if he's coming out of room six he was over on the 
even side of the hallway, and she was over, a little bit over. And so with respect to the direction in which she was firing, how was that in relation to where uh, Annette was standing? It looked like he was firing at her, but I didn't know if somebody came out of room five or seven. I didn't know. Did you see anybody else in the hallway at that time besides Annette? No. Okay. Do you know where the officer was at that time? I don't. So you see him firing towards Annette. Um, <coughs> did you see if he had struck her at that point? Or no. Did you see at that point? No, I took off running back into room 11, and I knew that he saw me, so I wasn't for sure if he was going to be trying to come after. So I was telling uh, room 11 to get in the bathroom, and, uh, and uh, as I was closing the door, I was trying to look and see if he was coming my way, but he was still standing there shooting. So you said that um, you knew that he saw you. How did you know that? Because he looked at me. How would you describe the way that he looked at you? Just with a smirk on his face. And so were you afraid that you may be harmed by him at that time? Absolutely. What were you, what were the thoughts in your head at that point? I'm just like, I'm trying to figure out what happened, what did we do, like, did he shoot, like, was it some confrontation with him and the officer? Because remember, I only saw the officer standing outside of room three. I don't, I don't know what happened. Okay, so you go back into the room and shut the door, and what, what did you do at that point? Uh, when I shut the door, I asked the, um, the patient in room 11 to get to the bathroom, because those are the only doors that's locked and that can lock, and I'm telling them, like, he has a gun, get in the bathroom, get in the bathroom. So I try to like pick up and call uh, Methodist police from the room phone, but it goes to like an operator. So I run in the bathroom too, because I don't know if he's coming down the hallway or not. And then uh, when I get in the bathroom, I see that the patient, uh, the father of the baby, he is in the bathroom. The patient's uh, boyfriend is in the bathroom and I'm asking them if anyone has a, a phone I can use. And so they let me use the phone and I try to call Methodist police, but I'm not getting anything. So then I call 911. And so going back to the point in time, either before or during the shooting, did you hear this individual, the defendant, say anything? Yes. What did he say? I was hearing him say, put him down, put him down, or give him, he said, put him down, put, give him to me, give him to me. And like he was just saying, I mean, it was so much yelling in between all of that. Like I heard her, like a female screaming. And then I heard him saying, give him to me, give him to me. And I heard her say, no, I'm not giving him to me. So when he said give him to me, do you know that what he was referring to? I thought he was referring to the baby. Did you see any of, any of what was going on? I could only hear everything. Um, at what point were you able to actually come out of the room after that? I came out of the bathroom once, like, when I didn't hear, like, any more shots, because I'm trying to uh, peep out the door to see, okay, did we get any help up here? And I peep out the door and I see there are officers there. So then I go back in the bathroom and lock the door. And then once like I don't hear any more uh, like screaming or anything, I go back out and I, uh, I peep and there's an officer there and I was showing him my uh, work badge and just asking him if I can come out. I was the charge nurse for the unit so he told me to come out and we needed to go check on like patients. Do you recall what agency that officer was with when you came out? He was with Dal uh, Dallas. He wasn't with Methodist. Okay, Dallas PD. <laughs> okay. And when you were able to actually come outside of the room, what was the scene like? Did it seem like it was calm? How would you describe the scene at that point? Uh, you know, there was no more yelling or anything like that. Um, we just went from room to room trying to get patients like make sure they were okay checking on patients. An officer went with me and another nurse to different rooms. Did you see anybody uh, injured at that point in time? No. Okay. I never saw anyone injured. Um, so 
So you keep referring to the female voice that you heard. Do you recall any other specific statements that you um, that you made? Yes, I heard her when I was in the bathroom. I heard her saying, uh, "Don't hurt him. Don't hurt him. He's already hurt. He's already down." He's uh, giving up the gun, and he was and she was screaming and just saying, "Don't hurt him." And Miss Smith, I know that your um, your tone is kind of low. If you wouldn't mind just speaking directly into the microphone so that we can hear you, because we're going to have to take it down. So okay. If you can just repeat to what you heard the female voice saying. She was saying, uh, "Don't hurt him. Don't hurt him. He's already down. He's already hurt. He's giving up the gun. Don't hurt him." Okay. So do you know who the female voice was referring to? I assumed it was referring to him. To the defendant? Yes. Okay. And when you saw this individual shooting, were you able to see the gun that he was firing with? I just saw it was a black gun. Okay. And was it a small gun? It, uh, it looked like a small gun. Gun that you were holding your hand, like a handgun? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Smith. I'll pass to Ms. Trump. Okay. I'd like to ask a couple questions for you. You said earlier that in your testimony here today that when you saw the defendant shooting that he was shooting towards Annette, is that correct? Yes. Okay, do you recall being interviewed by these two prosecutors as well as Investigator Swain from the District Attorney's Office back on September the 18th of 20 I do, yes. Do you recall at that time that you told them that you saw the defendant <laughs> shooting a gun out towards a couple of rooms but you couldn't tell what he was shooting at? He was shooting between room five and seven, and that's where Annette was standing, and he was aiming up high. Okay, but you told when you when you were interviewed, you know, they were taking notes when they interviewed you. You saw them taking notes, correct? Uh, yes, I did. And if you said uh, you didn't know what he was shooting at, and you never saw Annette get hit, did you? I never did. <coughs> And you said that at the time that you saw the defendant shooting that gun, that the door was virtually closed behind him. Is that right? Yes, it was. What was keeping that door propped open at that time? I don't know. But you said how, how much the door was open? It was probably about like this much okay, and space. Would I be accurate in, for the record to say that you're gesturing with your hands about six inches apart? Uh, yeah. Okay. I believe that's all I have for you. Thank you. Okay. as it pertains specifically with regard to you seeing the defendant firing with a gun. Um, you saw him firing the gun outside of the room, correct? Yes. Did you, did you see Annette in the hallway? I did. And again, specifically as it relates to where he was aiming, was it at and in the direction of Annette? Yes, it was. Um, but you did not see her get hit? Is that I didn't see her get hit. Okay. Did you see her fall or anything like no. that or walk away? No. Okay, but he was specifically firing towards Annette. Annette. Yes. you are still under my uh, instructions. You haven't heard all the testimony yet. You are not to discuss with each other um, or research on social media or talk to anybody else about what you've heard so far, okay? Sure. Yeah. Thank you.
rise. Good afternoon. You've been here all day, so I appreciate your patience, okay? Yes, sir. If you could please introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spell your first word for us. Uh, my name is Robert Rangel, R-O-B-E-R-T, last name is R-A-N-G-E-L. And Sergeant Rangel, how are you currently employed, sir? I work with the Methodist Health System for the Methodist Police Department. Okay, how long have you been with Methodist PD? About three years and maybe four months. And what are your current duties with the department? Basically, as far as supervisor, I pro reports, uh, work on schedules uh, for the Dallas campus. Um, I'm in charge of the, the units, the maintenance, making sure that they're equipped and running operationally. Um, answering calls for service within the hospital, outside in the parking lots. Uh, examples are dealing with patients who are altered, angered, uh, emotionally disturbed, uh, giving general directions within the hospital. Um, outside in the parking lots, we try to deter the uh, property crimes, uh, for burglaries, or stolen vehicles, uh, things of that nature. Do you know how many, how many officers are currently employed with Metro PD total? It fluctuates so much. Uh, right now, I would say it's probably 35, 38. And how many officers on any given shift? Are on duty. Ask me one more time, please. Yeah, on any particular given shift, how many officers are on duty at on any particular shift, on okay. average? At, at, at one hospital? Yes. Uh, at, at some hospitals, there's one officer. Uh, at some, there could be as many as four or five. Let's talk about best of the central. Uh, we typically run with uh, three officers there. All right, tell the jury a little bit about your background, your experience. Did you have any prior law, law enforcement experience prior to joining Metro PD? Yes, sir. Okay, with what department? I started in 1996 with the Beeville Police Department as a patrolman. And I was there uh, just short of three years. Um, I resigned there and I relocated to Hidalgo County Sheriff's Office, which is in the southern uh, part of Texas, McAllen area. I was there about 14 years. Um, and then I 
took one year off law enforcement, and then I ended up in the Bee County Sheriff's Office. As far as some of the, the, the duties that I had with Bebo PD, uh, which is my first job, I was a patrolman. Uh, I moved up to become a field training officer, um, and then I relocated to the Sheriff's Office. I started as a patrol deputy, and I uh, got uh, nominated to start the community policing program, which is completely new to South Texas. I was there about maybe nine months, and then I got moved to civil and warrants as far as uh, subpoenas, civil process, um, dealing with uh, uh, mental uh, mental patients. Um, I promoted to investigator at the sheriff's office. I started with the juvenile investigations, property crimes, and crimes against person. Then I went to the robbery homicide division. Uh, and then I promoted to sergeant, and as sergeant, I pretty much maintained within uh, criminal investigations. Uh, some other areas, as far as I was an um, academy instructor at the sheriff's office, a firearms instructor, a juvenile instructor. I was a negotiator with, uh, we called it the, we called it the SORT team, but it's the equivalent to a SWAT team, what most people refer to. Uh, I was a negotiator and, and the tactical um, I did uh, evidence, I was in charge of evidence, the, the management system, and uh, at, B, at B County Sheriff's Office, uh, I mainly just did uh, field training with uh, criminal investigations. Okay. <clears throat> so approximately when did you start with Memphis PD? What day? <clears throat> if I'm correct, it was... July 28th of 2020. Okay. And were you on duty on October 22nd of 2022 at approximately 11 a.m.? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall the time of your shift that day? On that day, I went in at 10 o'clock, and I was scheduled to get off at 2 o'clock, 2 p.m., 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. Okay, and do you recall how many other officers were on duty at that time for that particular time frame? Yes, we had two other officers. Okay. Um, do you remember their names? Yes, sir. Uh, Katricia McCrell, the patrol officer. And we have a, uh, I, just to kind of explain it, we call them PRNs, but they're outside police department officers who work part time with Methodist PRNs. We had Jaime Hinojosa. <coughs> And so on that day, um, at approximately between 10.30 and 11 uh, a.m., do you recall receiving <coughs> a call uh, that sent you to the fourth floor of the Schenker Tower? Yes, sir. What was the nature of the call that you received? Um, it was lost property. Yeah, I believe that dispatch aired it out on the radio. Okay. And so what did you do when you got the call? I responded from the ER, emergency room, I'm sorry, uh, emergency department, and... Uh, I went up the shingle to the shingle tower, which is the uh, tower where the postpartum is, and then I uh, walked to the fourth floor. Were you able to make contact with the individuals who uh, made the call? Yes, sir. Okay. And take us from there. What happened at that point? You made contact with the individual inside the building, and then what happened? Um, part of our, our procedures within the, the police department is we have these body cameras. I believe back then we were, we were using watch guard it's a different system than to the one that we now currently use. <coughs> so we always activate our cameras before we're going into the room, before we make contact with a person or persons. So I knocked on the door, um, and I, I typically, I always say police department just to kind of identify myself in case I have the wrong room or something. Um, I try to identify myself and I kind of slowly push the door open. I looked inside and there was a there was a gentleman. He was wearing a Dallas Cowboy jersey, and I believe the woman was that he was with was his wife. They were in the room. They were needing to follow a police report. Okay. <coughs> and so, at some point, um, do you exit the room? Yes, sir. For what reason? Uh, there was a knock on the door. Um, usually, when I walk into the room, because it's patients, I try to close the door behind me to kind of maintain that privacy for the patients. So I closed the door just enough where if somebody walked by, they couldn't see into the room for the patient. Uh, there was a soft knock on the door. I turned around, and it was a staff member. 
I don't know if she was a nurse, but I know she was a staff member because we have these hospital regulated IDs that we're required to wear within the hospital. And she walked in pushing some sort of cart or something. So I told the, the people that I was there to talk to, I said, I'm gonna give you guys some privacy. And I started to walk out towards the door and they said, no, you don't have to walk outside. And I was like, well, um, I just, I always have that habit. I just like to give them the privacy, right? While they're doing their, whatever they're doing. So I walked outside into the hallway and I just waited there uh, in the hallway while the nurse or the staff member was inside. So Sergeant Miner, let me ask you this. This particular unit, the first part of the unit where the mothers and the babies are, is that an, an open unit where people can go in and out or is it secure? It's secure, if, if you'll allow me to explain. Yes, sir, please. Um, on the, if, if you're coming up the Shingo elevators, there's a, I call it a call box button. You have to push the button and I believe there's like a little camera, mini camera, and then you have to speak to the person inside the, inside the unit, means within the, the secured area. There's a nurse that tries to establish as far as what kind of business you have in there to keep people that aren't um, supposed to be there outside. So you push mm -hmm. the call box, it turns on, uh, one of the staff members opens it, so I would say secure under those, which is typically it's always working. So in other words, somebody can't just walk in off the street. They would actually have to be buzzed in by an employee of the hospital. Yes, sir. All right, so you indicated that you had stepped out of the room to give the patient some privacy. What happened? Did anything unusual happen at that point? Yes, sir. Um, I was waiting in the hallway, and I was looking at the door, the door where I was supposed to be uh, talking to these people where the, the staff member was inside. And I... There's, there's always, I call it foot traffic, pedestrians, the workers inside in the hallways, whether it's a nurse, a doctor, uh, a technician, or uh, any type of hospital employee, there's always foot traffic within the hallways. So I try to kind of like hug the hall, hug the, uh, the hallway so I, I won't be blocking the hallway. And I, as I'm facing the door, the patient door where I'm supposed to be uh, talking to these people, um, I hear what I would describe as a, a light bulb that explodes or that pops, if, 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 if I'm explaining it correctly, like a light bulb that just popped. Okay, so you heard a popping sound? Yes, sir. And in your mind, again, you described it as sort of like a, a light bulb popping? Yes, sir. Okay, what are you thinking at that point? The first thing I'm thinking is, because like a day or two before, I made dinner at home for my kids and the person who made an error was myself. I, a light bulb, it was out, and I turned it, and it popped. And it shattered on top of all the food. So when I heard that noise, that's the first thing I thought, because it sounded identical to it. And when I hear the noise, I'm facing the door. So I turn to my right, and I turn scanning that way, because there's, there's probably maybe eight more rooms to my right. And the first thing my mind told me is light bulb. And then I hear what I would describe as someone asking for help. So my mind is like, which room is that coming from? And and so you, I'm sorry to cut you off a little bit, just to ask you about that. You stated that it sounded like somebody was asking for help. Could you tell whether or not the voice that you heard was a male or female voice? Female. And do you recall any specific statement that was made at that time, or was it just a general cry for help? It, it was a, a soft cry for help. Okay. So what did you do in response? The next thing that I remember processing in my mind was I saw a drop, lift, a, a drop of blood in the hallway, which at first, before I started working in the hospital, it always drew my attention because it's, it, 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 it's a, it, I've never worked in a hospital until I came to Methodist. But within the three years that I've been there, seeing droplets of blood on the floor is very, very common. Very common. So when I see the drop of blood, my mind is, pro is trying to process the noise, that voice I heard, and trying to figure out what's going on 
at that point. Did you see anybody else inside the hallway at that point? There was another nurse. Th there was a nurse in the hallway, uh, probably <coughs> maybe five feet away from me, give or take. Okay. Do you know her name? Or did you know her name at the time? No, sir, I did not. Okay. Can you describe what she looked like? Uh, she was a white female. She had on hospital scrubs that uh, the nurses wear. Uh, the, she had the same color of scrubs that the nurses wear up there in that unit. And what was she doing when you saw her? She was kind of facing me and I remember having, uh, I, carry a, I carried a little notepad to write my notes, my field notes. So I think at that point, because I'm waiting for the, the nurse to finish inside that room, I, have, I believe I have the notepad in my hand, one of my hands. So when I hear that noise that I identified as a light bulb, I turn, I see the drop of blood, and I hear a man's voice. I definitely, I can tell it was a man, it was a male's voice. And all within that same time, I hear a female start to scream hysterically. Can you tell what the male voice was saying? Something like, this is real. And uh, he, I could, I could clearly tell that he was very, very angry. Okay, and how was the sound of the female voice? Or did you hear any specific words? That the female voice was screaming. The female voice was screaming, "What the fuck? What the fuck?" And you described the male's voice as ang very angry. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How would you describe the tenor of the female's voice or the tone of her voice? Overwhelmed, hysterical, and is trying to. From from what I from from what I could hear and how she sounded, she was trying to understand what was happening. And just so the record is clear for the jurors. So that's clear. This is after you heard the pop, the pop. Yes, sir. Okay. So describe for us what you do next. You hear the popping sound. You see the nurse in the hallway. You hear the screaming from both voices. What do you do at that point? I took a couple of steps towards the door where the nurse was in that area, and I believe I tried to talk to her like to watch out or to, 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 to move or something like that. Because every, every, my mind was really starting to flip out inside of me within everything that was happening. And, and I tried to tell the nurse to like keep walking or something like that. You said that your mind was starting to flip out. Why did you feel that way? <clears throat> In order, and I'm sorry, I have to repeat it for me to try to remember it in order is, I hear the, what I describe as a light bulb. I hear the female voice like, help. I turn, I see the drop of blood. And I see the nurse standing or kind of making one or two steps towards where I thought the male and the female who had already, the female had already screamed, what the F, what the F. And the, the man, he was, I could tell he was angry. And it was right in that time that I heard another gunshot. I, I, I heard a gunshot that I said, this is a gunshot. So I, you heard the gunshot and then what happened? Was, were you able to see who was shooting at that point? I, I slow walked very slowly. I couldn't see inside the room, but at that time, I was like 99% sure that it was coming from the first room to my right, down the hallway. So I'm trying to look into the room without putting myself in that fatal funnel. 
in my mind, because the man is screaming, the woman is screaming, and then I, um, I, I try to look, I want to look at the nurse, but I don't want to keep my eyes, I don't want to take my eyes off of the door, because that's where my danger is. So I try to look over there and look at her and, and the, th the third shot is what I remember the nurse got hit by a bullet and as she tells me I, I'm hurt I think I've been hit and I'm just going like this because all in that same time I, as I'm getting right towards the, the, the door within my uh, field of view, I saw a Hispanic male. He had on blue jeans and a black muscle shirt, and he had a black pistol in his hand. So going back to you described that um, when you heard the additional gunshots, that's when you realized that the nurse had been hit because she said something along those lines, I've been hit, I'm hurt, correct? Yes, sir. I I can I can say with certainty that when I managed to like glance real quick at the nurse, I saw some blood around her neck and she was holding her neck. Okay. And so going back, you were kind of giving us a description of this individual uh, with the gun, correct? Yes, sir. At what point do you recall actually seeing this person? It was right around the, the time that the nurse got hit with the with the uh, bullet. And so, just so we're all clear, um, you heard two additional shots, correct? After the first initial shot that you thought was a light bulb, you heard yes. two more. Yes, sir. Were you able to see who was firing those shots, or did you just hear them? I heard the shots. I couldn't see who was firing up until the point that I saw the Hispanic male with a pistol in his hand. That's, that's who I identified as the person who was shooting. Uh, so you gave a description of this Hispanic male. Uh, can you describe what the gun looked like? Based on, on my personal experience with firearms, I have to say, uh, there was a, I know it was a dark color, black color. It looked like maybe a 380. And the individual that you saw with the gun that day, um, can you identify that person? Is that person in court today? Yes, sir. If I'm in seat number one, my co-counsel is in seat number two all the way down the line, please identify what seat number he's seated in. It's going to be in the fifth seat. He's wearing the uh, black uh, jacket, black tie. May the record reflect this witness have identified the defense of the court? The record will show that. Thank you. Okay, so you hear the two additional shots, you see the male with the gun in his hand, what did you do at that point? I, I took a couple of steps back and I, I drew, I, I took out my, my handgun and at that same time, uh, the nurse who had been hit, who was standing in the hallway, she's walking towards the what I call the charge nurse desk is it's kind of the main desk where the people check in and check out as far as the uh, the nursing station as, and as I took a couple steps back my mind was trying to process right and I, I my gun I'm, I'm right-handed so I took my gun out with my right hand and I put my gun in my left hand because my body was towards the wall and I knew that if I needed to, if I needed to shoot, I'd have a better, I'd have a, a, a broader area with my left hand. But I also knew that the male, he retreated back. And so there was, there was a couple of seconds where he and I, we lost co like eye contact with each other. And, uh, there's 
I'm, I'm really short on words. I don't know how I'm going to try, try to describe it as best I can. As I'm, if, I'm, if this is the hall right here, this, this table, I'm walking backwards. The gun, the pistol is in my left hand at this time. And at the point that I, I get to the next room, there's like a small, I call it like a little pocket. You can actually get out of the hallway and you can stand right there. So I, I retreated to try to take cover. And once I felt, once, excuse me, once I felt that I could get to my radio, which I, I, I carry the microphone up here on, on this side, I radioed, I communicated to our dispatcher. And I'm sorry to cut you off, but just yes, sir. For the, so the record is clear, when you pointed to this side, which side were you referring to on the body? Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, my left side. Yes, sir. Okay, so you keep the radio up on the shoulder area? Yes, sir. Okay, and you also indicated that, um, that when you made eye contact with the defendant, that he retreated back. Where did he retreat to? In, in, inside the room. Back into the room. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall what room number that this all occurred in? I, I, I don't know, sir. Okay, that's okay. And so you say he retreated back inside the room. You yourself retreated back. Changed uh, the gun, I guess, to your left hand. Yes, sir. And you talked about how you began to make sure that you could call out on the radio. Tell us about that. Yes, sir. I, I, um, I, I know on the radio I probably had a stutter moment because we used to use 10 codes where I worked, and at the hospital we don't use 10 codes. So I know in that moment that I probably use a 10 code. And what is a 10 code? A, a 10 code is it's a, it's a series of, of preset numbers that police officers uh, use to, um, what word am I to minimize radio traffic. So if I want to say a man with a gun, I'll say male 1032. That 1032 means uh, someone with a pistol or a handgun. Okay, so on this occasion, you called um, over the radio, and, and what was the description that you put out? I, 110 is my call sign or my element number. So um, I said 110 dispatch. I said there's a mail, uh, 1032, up here on uh, postpartum. And um, I gave him the description, uh, Hispanic male, black muscle shirt, uh, blue jeans. At some point, once I, I felt that I could safely try to look against the wall to the room number, I gave dispatch the room number. Okay. And to your knowledge, were you the only police officer um, at the scene at that time? Yes, sir. So you called out for help. Um, did you have any further contact with the defendant at that point? At that at that moment that I was communicating, I was calling dispatch to tell them to send me uh, Dallas police and to send me an, an additional Methodist police officer. I wasn't talking to the mail. I was wanting to make sure that dispatch heard me. And and usually. The way that I know and they hear is they acknowledge. They'll, they'll, they'll repeat or they'll say something to acknowledge. And so I wanted to make 100% sure that they heard me. And I wanted to make sure because the radios we have within the hospital sometimes are not reliable. So I wanted to make sure they heard me and so I was focused on dispatch. And it wasn't until I took some other footsteps, and, I, and I'll describe that, but um, at that moment, no, sir. No, I was not talking to the male. Okay. At some point, did the male come back and try to come back outside the room? Yes, sir, he did. Um, as, I, as I walk backward and backwards initially, and I, I try to take cover in that little pocket area that was in the, in the room down, I moved across the hallway 
because I didn't want to be in the same spot where he had seen me. So I moved to give myself a, 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 an advantage. I'm thinking, well, he's going to look for me here. I'm going to be over here. It was after that I crossed the hallway that uh, the male, he came back out of the room. And when I say out of the room, he, 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 he walked oh, like past the door and he was looking down the hallway to where he had last seen me. Did you see if he had anything in his hand at that point? Yes, sir. What did he have in his hand? He had a, the same pistol that he had in his hand the first time I had seen him. Okay, you just saw him just looking down the hallway to see where he last saw you? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what did you do at that point? At that point, it, it's kind of like time had really slowed down and probably hadn't, but at that time I had already made a decision within myself that a nurse had been shot and I only knew about one at that time. And I told myself, I'm the only, I'm the only one up here right now. I would, I would glance to see if uh, McCrell or Jaime Hinojosa had, had, had made their way up to the floor, but at that point they hadn't. So my mind is telling me, if he comes out of the room empty-handed, I'm going to tell him to you know, keep his hands up and get up on the floor. And I told myself, if he came out with a pistol, I only had one option. And that was to make sure that he didn't get out past the room with a gun. Okay, so what did you do? When when I saw him, and he he was looking out of the room. He had the pistol, and I fired one time at his leg. Why did you fire at that time? Because I fired at that time because I, I feared for my life. I feared that if he came out of the room that he was going to try to shoot more people. Okay. So how many shots did you fire? One shot. And could you tell when you fired that shot whether or not you hit him with that shot? Yes, sir. I, I know I hit him. Okay, how do you know? The way he jumped back. Okay, so what, did, uh, what happened, what did he do after you were able to tell that you hit him with the shot that you fired? He, he, re, he went back into the room. And there was still a lot of screaming in the room uh, from the female who was in the room. Did you hear what she was saying? I just remember that she was still screaming hysterically, hysterically. I can't recall what she said. Okay. Did, was the defendant making any statements at that time once he retreats back into the room? I'm sorry, ask me one more time. Yeah, did you hear after you shot the defendant, could you hear him making any statements until he went back inside the room? Was he talking to you or could you hear anything that he was saying at that time? He, he was, he was, um, complaining about leg, uh, his leg, his leg, and the female, um, I think at, at, at some point within that, that second, uh, she kept screaming, please don't kill him, please don't kill him. Do you know who she was talking to? It appeared that she was talking to me. Okay. So what did you do with that? At that time, I, I tried to I was trying to find out a name for the room. Officer McCrell probably at that same time she uh, made her way to the floor, and I gave McCrell, Officer McCrell, a description. I think I repeated the description. Officer McCrell and the room I can't remember if I just pointed to the room or said room number 
but I told McCrow that he was in that room right there. Were you able to determine uh, a name for the room or who was inside the room? No, sir. I, I asked McCrow if she could try to get a name from the charge area to, cause I, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to try to use a name to, as a negotiating tool, to try to, instead of saying, hey, you, just, but it, 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 it didn't work at that time. Okay. Were you able to speak with the defendant at that time? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell us what you told him and if you got a response from him, from the defendant. Um, I, I told him that uh, he needed to uh, throw the gun out of the room. I told him, I asked him, I said, if you can let the people go, let you just got to let them go, partner. You got to let them go. Let's, uh, just, let's get the people out of there. And did you get any response from the defendant? There was a response. It was still non-compliant response. Did the defendant throw the gun out of the room? In, in that second, no, sir. It, it took a little bit. Did the defendant come out of the room at, at that point when you were ordered him to come out of the room? No, sir. Okay. Did anybody come out of the room at that point? No, sir. Okay. Um, at some point, did you realize that some other officers are coming to, to assist at the scene? Yes, sir. There, there was one Dallas officer, Dallas Police Department officer, I don't know his name, but he he stacked up right across me on the hallway. And I gave him the information as well as the description, excuse me, the description. And probably within maybe 10, 15 seconds, there was a second Dallas Police Department officer. Okay. Additional officers? I, I try, I kept trying to uh, convince him to throw the gun out and we, he and I spoke just briefly, a couple of words and I, I just kept trying to tell him, hey, just come out of the room. I know at some point in time the female who was in the room said that he couldn't walk. Okay, so what do you do at that point? At that point, I know myself, and there was another Dallas Department, Dallas Police Department officer who was, uh, we were trying to convince for someone to throw the gun out. At some point, did the gun come out of the room? Yes, sir. Do you know who threw the gun out? I do not. Okay. So after the gun is out of the room, what do you do? After the gun is out of the room, you can see it in the hallway. Myself and two or three uh, Dallas Police Department officers, we start to walk up towards the room. And I didn't know it at the time, but uh, Dallas Police Department they actually had a shield with them, but I, I, I just, I didn't know that. And as we're walking, it kind of seems like they stopped for a second. When you say they, who was the first uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the Dallas Police Department. In, 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 yes, sir. In my mind, they stopped. And I'm, my mind is like, why are we stopping? What did you feel like needed to be done at that point? We needed to at least be able to look into that room because the gun was in the hallway and I know I had a cover unit. A cover unit means I have a secondary officer, a third officer. Um, so as it kind of seems like everything just stopped for a second, it, it, it seemed longer, but it was probably just a second or two. I take a step back and then 
I take a, a step forward and I try to take what I call a quick peek into the room where you just kind of like look in and you look out. Were you able to see anything inside the room when you do that? Yes, sir. What did you see? The other nurse who lived inside. Did she appear to be deceased? Yes, sir. Okay. Were you able to see anybody else inside the room besides the deceased? I think on my first quick peek, no, because I was so focused on on the nurse who was on the floor. Okay. At some point, were you able to take another look to see if somebody else was inside the room? Yes, sir. Okay, who did you see? I saw the defendant. He was, if, if I can give you this direction, the hospital bed is situated north and south in a direction inside the room. And he was on the south side of the bed. Uh, on he was he was on he was on the floor. Lying on the floor. Yes, sir. Was he face up or face down? From what you recall? And if you don't recall, it's okay. I don't recall. Okay. At some point, do you uh, do you make entry into the room? I started to once I saw him and saw that he was was there um, with with blood as well. But then. One of the Dallas officers, they grabbed me by my collar, and they were they were telling me, "Sarge, Sarge, we got a shield, we got a shield." And it wasn't until that they grabbed me that they basically they staggered in front of me with the shield, and uh, it was the Dallas Police Department that first made entry into the like actually going past the, the door. Okay, so our officers were able to go in and take custody of the defendant. Yes, sir. Okay, and did they bring him out into the hallway? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, did you hear any, the defendant making any statements at that time? Yes, sir. Okay, what did he say? Uh, he said that she cheated. Do you know who the defendant was referring to when he said that she cheated? I believe that he was referring to the female who was inside the room. <coughs> and do officers give first aid to the defendant at that time? Yes, sir. Did you assist with that at all, or did you observe that? I assisted with that. Okay, what did you do to assist? They applied a tourniquet uh, to his injured leg, and I was trying to keep his head in an upright position because he was he was lying on the floor. So I wanted to try to keep his head in a, in a comfortable position. Did you notice anything about um, the defendant's <coughs> demeanor or attitude, the way he looked, anything unusual about him was asked to you from what you observed? I'm sorry, ask me again? Yeah, did you notice anything about the way that the defendant was acting, looked, the, the general demeanor, anything off or unusual to you about him? Just, he appeared, um, of course he was in a lot of pain that I, because of the way he was moaning. And I was trying to ask him his name. And he, he the, the, the main thing I remember him saying is that she cheated. So I just, I, I try to keep his head um, upright as the, uh, the officers put the tourniquet on his leg. So after the first aid is done, what happens next? At some point, I know that the lady was carrying a baby in, in her arms. I think she still had an IV pole or some, something. Some, she had some wires on her or something. So I asked her, I said, is the baby hurt? And she said, no. And I was like, give me the baby. And I basically um, passed the baby to another Dallas officer or, or, or someone, a nurse. I, I can't remember who it was. Okay. So at some point, um, the defendant is, I guess, wheeled away for medical treatment. Did you have any further contact with the defendant after that point? No, sir. Okay. So what did you do after that, after they wheeled the defendant away? 
I took the, the, the mother who was inside, the female who was inside the room. I took her down towards the charge nurse area, the, the nurse desk, and I asked her to sit down in a chair. Yes, sir. We went into several rooms checking for any other people who might have been hit with gunfire. Okay. Any other injuries that you observed? No, sir. So as far as I'm right here, were you wearing a body-worn camera that day? Yes, sir. And was it recording at the time of this incident? Yes, sir. Mr. Folks, are we Charlie? You may. Can you tell me whether or not you've seen that before? Yes, sir. Okay, turn it over. And how do you know that that's that you've seen this before? That's my signature with the date that I. And have you had the opportunity to watch the full video that's contained on this DVD? Yes, sir. Does it fairly, fairly, and accurately depict the events that took place on October twenty second, two thousand twenty two, at Methodist Central Hospital? Yes, sir. Has it been altered or deleted in any way? No, sir. This time the state's going to offer a statement again. 17, can the council stand? Second. No objection. Statement number 17 is admitted for all purposes. Thank you, Rob. This time the state's going to offer a Further offer state exhibit number 16, which is a crop and zoom diagram of the floor plan of the hospital, specifically related to 44 Schenkel in the school. Council for objection. No objection. State exhibit 16 is admitted for all purposes. Thank you, Your Honor. And further, pursuant to a stipulation of the state, would also offer state exhibit number 13, which is going to be surveillance video from Methodist Hospital, uh, Post Parkland South Hall, is the view of this particular surveillance video, as well as state exhibit number 14, which is going to be a flash drive containing surveillance video from the public entry. And we have no objection to those, Your Honor. All right, state exhibit 13 and 14 mm -hmm. are admitted for all purposes. Permission to publish to the jury, Your Honor? Yes, you may. For the record, Your Honor, State Exhibit Number 14, which is surveillance video from the public entry vantage point, is a total of eight hours and 24 minutes. However, obviously, we're not going to play the entire thing. We're just going to play uh, two small snippets. And so I'll state for the record that I played them at the time that we played. All right. Does the defense have any objections? No, Your Honor.
Sergeant Blondell, you kind of described the setup for us, but um, as we're looking at safety exhibit number 14, what are we looking at in this particular view of the surveillance video? That, that is the general public entry, exit doors into the postpartum unit. And so just to describe for the record, to the left of the, to the top left of the screen, you see the public entry doors, is that correct? Yes, sir. And towards the right bottom, you see where the staff members um, are seated at the nurse's station? Yes, sir. Is that where, as you described earlier, uh, the staff can see who's coming in and buzz people in and out there? Yes, sir. There's a secretary that sits uh, down, I believe she's in the black, if you see her behind the counter. Uh, she's tip, she's always the, the one that has that uh, that uh, access as far as to see who's buzzing at the door. Okay. So we'll just let this run. I'm gonna pause for the record at 10, 30, and 33 seconds. This individual, if you can see my pointer, is this the defendant that you came into contact with with the gun that day? Yes, sir. Does he appear to have some kind of hand or something in his hand here? Yes, sir. Okay. For the record, he takes the mask and he continues to proceed down the hallway. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. So I'm going to pause that video at 10, 30, and 41 seconds for the record. So at this time, Sergeant will switch to the South Hall view. For the record, this particular video, case exhibit number 13, is a total of four hours, 13 minutes, and 13 seconds. We're not going to play the entire thing either. I'm going to skip forward for the record to a time of 10.30 and 37 seconds. And this was stipulated to by the uh, defense? Yes, ma'am. It wasn't until after everything that I discovered that. back towards the top of the screen that we see you there in the hallway? Yes, sir. You can see my pointer here. <coughs> we also 
proceed, uh, the third proceed complaint is Jacqueline Fukua, also proceeding down the hallway. Yes, sir. And at this point, you see Katie and their flowers proceed towards the nurse station and testify to correct? Yes, sir. What are you doing at this point in the video? Are you 11 or 5 or 50 seconds? Right there, I was most likely uh, communicating with your dispatch as far as the, uh, the mail inside with the handgun. You let your gun out at that time? Yes, sir. And it's very quick. I'll back it up to 11.05 and 15, 11.06 and 15 seconds. As you proceed to the other side of the hallway, we're going to focus our attention, if you see my cursor, to the door of the room. Yes, sir. We see the defendant begin to come out. Is that when you shoot? Yes, sir. Okay. And so I'll pause this video at 11.06 and 35 seconds. Next, we'll publish state's exhibit number 17, which is going to be your body worn camera video. <coughs> just for the uh, jury's information there's no audio for the first 30 seconds of your body cam video you know why that is that that's a that's a feature that it, it's called like a sleep mode it activates it goes back 30 seconds before you actually activate it if that makes sense if I explain it correctly <coughs> yes, sir. and just for the jury's information at this point no shooting has occurred. You just responded to the initial call, correct? Yes, sir.
just trying to figure out if where would you find the glasses or what happens to the glasses? Okay, let me let me start with this. Let me get some information for y'all. Let me uh, backtrack over there real quick. Uh, yeah, should I can go through the brain again and I can and all our stuff that we have upstairs and turn out nowhere to be found. What is your name, sir? My name is Ignacio Salcedo. What's your birthday, sir? Uh, 10 5 76. What's a good telephone number for you? 214-206-7945. Address? Uh, 3442 Kenmore. Kenmore, like K-E-N-M-O-R-E? Yes, sir. Okay. Dallas, Texas. Zip code, please? 75223. I probably the doctor already saw the result. Okay. So. I'll give you a minute. It's okay. Oh, it's okay. Oh, yeah. That's fine. How are you doing? Okay. I'll give you a minute now. I saw the owner. I saw the owner. Oh, that's fine. I'll, I'll give you a minute. Thank you. Okay, I'm Robert. 
your name, partner? What's your name? Talk to me. Okay. Okay, listen. We can work this out, partner, okay? All I want to do is just get the people outside, please. We can work this out. Just let them outside, okay? Just throw the gun outside. Throw the gun out, please. Throw the gun outside. Parker, we can work this out, man. Trust me. Now, did you know the defendant prior to this day? No, sir. But you didn't know his name, right? No, sir. And so you asked him for his name, and then he said Nestor. Is that accurate based on what we heard? Yes, sir. <clears throat> but later on, you, you're referring to him as, as Victor. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. Why were you referring to him as Victor? Is that because you didn't hear his name clearly, or, or what was that about? When I first, saw, when I first heard him say his name, I heard Victor. Okay. I think my hearing was a little up and down. And uh, it wasn't until a little later that I, I found out it's true in him. But I, initially, I, I interpreted Victor when he spoke. Okay. But just to be clear for the record and for the jury, this person that you're conversing with is the defendant in this case, Nestor Hernandez, correct? Yes, sir, correct. Okay, and so you ask him, you tell him that we can work this out the audio that we heard. What was it? Did you hear his response? I couldn't make it out. I heard him respond. I just didn't, I wasn't sure what he said. Thank 
pound black muscle t-shirt. Um, I don't know if it's a female or even a baby in size. A female is a shooter? No, the male is a shooter. Is that why you're standing? He's standing about maybe 5'5", five, 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 probably about 20, 24 years of age. Uh, all I can see is a black pistol. Is he right now? No, no. He walked in the room. I, I actually, he was coming out, but he had the gun in his hand. I shot one time and he went back in the room. Get him outside, please, partner. Partner, we can work this, man. Come on, work with us. Work with us. Work with us, please. Yes, sir, I'm listening. Let, let him outside, buddy. Come on. Come on, man. You got to give us something. Come on. Hey, the bro, can you get uh, the, the name to that room number, please? Last name or something, something I can work with. Victor, come on, man. Work with me, brother. I'm missing, brother. I'm here. Throw the gun outside, man. Come on. Throw that gun outside, partner. Come on, work with me. Throw that gun out. Come on, man. Come on, Victor. Work with me, man. Come on. Okay. Hands, hands up, hands up in the air. Hands up in the air, please. Hands up in the air, please. Hands up in the air, come on. Hands up in the air, Richard. come on. Throw the gun out. I give you my word. He ain't got nothing in his hands. Okay. Victor, throw that gun out, please. Come on. Because he got a gun in his hand. Does he got the gun in his hand? We need a gun outside. 
I need the gun outside, please.
Sorry, ask me one more time. Yeah, if we're looking at the video, we can kind of see that the audio that we hear is a little bit ahead of the video. So, like, you'll hear the audio and then you'll see his mouth move. Do you know why that is? That was a, I'm not going to say a feature, that was a, a defect that, um, uh, not Axon, Axon is our current, the, the former, oh my God, I forgot the name of it, um, WatchGuard. WatchGuard had that deep that lag where I'm talking but it's talking up here as right. far as in timeline okay but we could clearly hear the defendant say she was cheating on me and then maybe like five seconds later five or, six, five or eight seconds later she cheated on me yes sir there's a very clear yes sir here. Yes, sir. State of Texas? Yes, sir. And the handgun that the defendant used to shoot uh, the social worker and the nurse, uh, was that a firearm? Yes, sir, it is. And is a firearm considered a deadly weapon? Yes, sir. What kind of uh, what kind of gun did you have that day? What gun did you use to shoot the defendant? It was a department-issued Glock 9mm. Based on our state exhibit number 
Show us where the nurse's station is. Okay, and then the public entry video that we saw, where would that be located on the diagram? Okay, and can you show the jury on the diagram where uh, the shooting took place, that particular room that we just saw in the body one tank video? Okay, and where were you located uh, when you responded to the initial call? Where was that room located? I'm not sure the jurors on this side. I can't see. I'm sorry. Yeah, they didn't see me. Can we move this a little bit closer? I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Did you ever physically lay eyes upon the defendant at any time prior to your engaging with him and, and shooting him in the leg? Yes, sir. And when exactly was the first time you saw him? It was when uh, the, the nurse was in the hallway, right about that time where she was shot, that he, I saw, I saw the defendant come out of the room uh, with a pistol in his hand. Okay, and, was, and, and did you see him before or after the, gun, the pistol discharge? Af, after, if, if, if I may, um, yes. kind of going back just so I can make sure that I'm explaining it correctly. I'm standing in the hallway. I'm waiting to go back into the room where they had dispatched me to go right. take this report. I hear what I describe as a light bulb Correct. pop. I turn between that time that I hear the, the light bulb noise, there was a second gunshot, and then there was another shot where the nurse got hit in the hallway. Right. Now, from the video, uh, from the video that we've observed, at the time that the uh, the nurse appears to have been in the hallway appears to have been shot. You were on the right side of the hallway, were you not? Correct. Yes. Sir. And the doorway itself was in a recess on the same side of the hallway that you were on, was it not? Yes, sir. Uh, so, is it your testimony that the defendant came out of the room all the way into the hallway where you could have seen him from the same side of the hallway? If, if I may uh, correct, I, I when I saw the defendant. I'm, I'm, he wasn't standing like in the hallway. He kind of peeked out, he, excuse me, he peeked out of the, the doorway just enough where I could see him. I, I clearly saw 
saw his what he was wearing, and then when I looked and I looked at his hand, that's when I saw the pistol. But he was still in that what I call that pocket area. Yes. And you saying that this was occurred before or after the the, uh, the uh, discharge of the firearm that, that uh, struck the second nurse? That's fine, sir. Well, the video will speak for itself. We'll revisit that issue. The last question I want to ask you, sir, or the last series of questions, uh, the video shows that at the time that uh, you, as well as the other officers, uh, uh, breached into the uh, room, uh, it shows the female in that room standing on the uh, left side of the bed or what would be the closest side of the bed to the front door of the room, correct? Correct. Uh, did you observe any obstruction or anything that would have kept her from being in that location earlier before y'all came in the room? Uh, obstruction meaning? Did, she, did Was there anything that kept her from being in that particular location that she was in? Did you see, did you see any cords or anything, any IV cords, anything that was preventing her from standing there when, where she was when you uh, entered the room? Not, not, a, not like a, a blockage. If that's what you're asking me, or cords. Well, basically, I just want, I just want to, to bring up the point with you that when y'all, when the door finally opened, you guys went into the room. She was standing there between the bed and the restroom in that room, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I believe that's all I have for you right now, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Just one question, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Sergeant Whitehead, really quick, I'm just going to show you a brief portion of State Bill Number 17, your body worn camera. Again, we're for the record at 303. We see an individual here in uh, some blue scrubs. Does this appear to be the deceased individual that you saw uh, in the room later on? Yes, sir. For the record, that would be the deceased individual. Back with you, please. Nothing further at this time, brother. All right, Native, what is your name? Uh, that's Sub State Law. Sub Street Law. All right, thank you, um, Sergeant. Please yes. remain within a gunshot until the other side wants to recall you, okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, would you all like a 15 minute break at this time? Yes. yes all right, let's do that. Let's come back at uh, 2.50. All right.
setting that it was running in, you know, I, was, I turned off the microphone when I was going to break. But, uh, that was not supposed to be happening. And I've gotten several messages from Christina Ethan and the how it works. Uh, I am I can record just like a normal camcorder here. But when nothing's <laughs> happening, I am not it's not rolling. But it's going back out as the pool camera to everybody else to record. So it's, I'm serving as the pool camera for the rest of the the media in the, in the market. And so maybe they're seeing because the camera's turned on, they're probably seeing
Richard, sir. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir. If you could please introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling it for the court reporter. Yes, my name is uh, Emmanuel Esquea, E N M A N U E L E S Q U E A. And how are you employed, sir, currently? Currently, uh, I work for the Department of uh, Homeland Security. Okay, do you live here in Dallas? No, sir. Okay, where are you currently located? Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Uh, where did you work uh, prior to your current position? I was a police officer for the Dallas Police Department. And how long were you with the Dallas Police Department? Five years. So what are your current duties with the uh, Department of Homeland Security? Uh, currently, um, I'm a federal law enforcement for the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, when surrounding counties arrest uh, citizens, or not citizens, but uh, migrants that are removable from the United States, they take them to the intake center, then I process them to see an immigration judge. Okay, let me take you back to the day of October 22nd, 2022. Were you with the Dallas Police Department at that time? I was. And what were your duties at that time, sir? Uh, I was assigned to patrol, sir. Uh, my duties were responding to calls for service. Okay, do you recall receiving uh, a call um, at the Methodist Central Hospital that day while you were on duty? Yes, sir. What was the nature of the call? The nature of the call, I believe it came out as a um, active shooter call. Okay. Were you alone or did you have a partner with you that day? At the time, uh, my partner and I, I don't remember his name, we were in uh, West Dallas uh, finishing another call for service when the active shooter call came out. Did you, in fact, uh, respond to the active shooter call at the hospital? Yes, sir. Okay, describe for the members of the jury uh, what happened when you got there to the hospital. Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, once we got the call, uh, my partner and I, uh, we dropped what we were doing and we headed to the hospital. And as we were driving, uh, we have a computer in the screen. And every time someone calls, you keep seeing notifications that Someone else called, someone else called, and they were all saying the same thing on the call sheet. Um, I've been to Methodist Hospital a few times, so I had a good idea where the maternity ward was, which was where the call for service was. So I parked down there in the Sally Port. Um, I drive these, uh, it's called the CERT car, which has some of the breaching equipment in the trunk, like a, a slammer and a ballistic shield. So, um, Myself and a few other officers that arrived there at the same time, we parked there and I start getting some of the equipment. I didn't know if we needed it or not. So um, I, of course, uh, grabbed the shield and I gave the breaching equipment, the sledgehammer, to one of my partners that was there with me. Um, so we go through in through the first floor and then we see some people walking around and uh, we all go into the elevator, at least four or five of us. Um, when did you make it to the uh, to the location where the shooting occurred? Excuse me. At some point, did you make it to the location where the shooting occurred on the fourth floor? Yes, sir. Okay. What's the uh, what's going on there at the scene when you got there? If you had to describe what was happening. Yeah. So um, as soon as the elevators opened, uh, the first thing you see was um, it was silent, and the first thing you did you see was a pool of blood, and um, I guess that's the first time I realized like. Th this is something serious. Um, I realized like um, that something would happen. So we um, went through the doors on the left and then we see officers uh, stacked up on both sides of the, of the hallway. Um, I don't remember what agencies there were, but um, I was the one with the shield. So um, I knew eventually that I had to make my way to the front because that was the only way we were getting inside the room. Um, so we eventually push up and then um, I face the front of the door, then I see one of the healthcare workers' body on the ground, uh, covered in blood, and she wasn't responding. And I saw another man's uh, body on the floor, face down. Uh, I felt like we were there for minutes on end, but um, we kept giving him commands and commands and commands to come out, but we wouldn't respond. So. Um, eventually, one of the officers kind of like pushed me forward to go in. And so, so um, just to stop you real quick, officer, uh, were you the first to enter the room? Yes, sir. Okay. And when you say you saw a man lying face down on the ground, um, did you know who that person was? At the time, I did not, sir. Okay. Uh, and so, 
So at some point you may take him to the room, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, what happens when you may take him to the room? Well, let me ask you this, was there anybody else inside the room besides the deceased worker and the male? The there was the male and then there was the mother of, there was a mother <coughs> holding an infant child in the room also. Okay, so what happens when you may take him to the room? Um, so I enter the room and um, I step over the uh, woman's body and um, I had to put the shield down. So I put the shield down and um, I grab the man's hand and another officer, we put handcuffs on that man. So the man that you placed handcuffs on that day, are you able to identify that person? No, sir. At that time, he was face down, covered in blood, and I did not get a good chance to actually see his face, sir. Okay. And so once you place handcuffs on him, what happens at that point? At that point, um, other officers carry him out of, out of the room, and I believe a, some officers put a tourniquet on his leg from what I saw, sir. Okay. Did you have any further contact with the, uh, the person that was with you that day after that point? After that, sir, I briefly had contact with him while we escorted him to another floor to as take him to some uh, doctors that would tend to his injuries. And besides that, no, sir. Okay. Were you equipped with a body worn camera that day? Yes, sir. And was it recording? It was, sir. Mr. Folks, are we just running? You may. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you what's been marked. It's state exhibit number 18. Does this look familiar to you? Yes, sir. And is this a DVD containing uh, your body-worn camera video from that day, October 22nd, 2022? Yes, sir. Um, have you had an opportunity to watch this entire recording? I have. Um, does it fairly and accurately depict the events that took place at uh, Methodist Central Hospital that day? Yes. Has it been changed or altered in any way? No, sir. It's time you are placed on the office stage. Give me number 18. Can you count this objection? No objection. State exhibit 18 is admitted for Mission folks, y'all. So for the record, Judge, uh, this video is 47 minutes and one second. However, the state is only going to play the first four minutes of the video. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's go. You need to get out of the 
I do. Thank you. My name is Officer Jonathan Anderson. That's J O N A T H A N A N D E R S O N. Yes, that's correct. How long have you been with DPD? Since uh, March of 2014. Okay, what are your current duties? Currently, I'm on uh, assignment in the patrol in Southwest Division. All right, let me take you back to the date of October 22nd, 2022. Were you with DPD at that time? Yes. And do you recall responding to an active shooter call at Methodist Central Hospital on that day? Yes, I do. Um, just describe for the members of the jury, did you respond to the hospital? Um, I was actually in the emergency. Um, um, parking for the ambulances. I just went there to uh, use the restroom when the call came out. Okay, when you got the call, what did you do? Uh, there were three other officers actually that were nearby. So we all grouped up. I grabbed my rifle and we went to the hospital. 
And did you at some point arrive at the location where the, sh the shooting took place? Yes, I did. Okay, what did you do when you got there? Um, well, I assessed the scene. Um, when we got to the correct floor, we tried to determine which way we needed to go, where the threat was. Um, I remember I looked to my right and I saw that there was a <clears throat> woman that had been shot that was on the ground. Um, Can you describe what that person looked like? Um, female, a white female. Did she appear to be uh, moving or anything that you can tell as far as her talking, moving, anything like that? She wasn't moving. And at that point, some other individual came and started to uh, give her aid, okay. trying to remove her from that area. What did you do at that point? Uh, there, I continued with the rest of the officers down the hallway. Uh, we were directed to where well, we made a left turn down the hallway to where there were more officers that were already uh, in the hallway. And they were taking a position to, I guess, have some cover from where the shooter was at. So we just continued making our way down the hallway um, to try and get to the room where the shooter was. Okay. Um, at some point, um, <coughs> after other officers were given command, did you all make entry into the room? Yes, yeah, we finally did. Okay, what happened when you went inside the room? <coughs> um, the female was there who um, had just, I guess, given birth to the baby. So we're trying to get her out of the way and make sure it was safe and take the uh, suspect into custody. Okay, and you were able to take the sus suspect into custody? Yes, we were. Are you able to identify that suspect? Yes. Today? Um, if I'm seated in seat number one, co-counsel seat number two, what seat would, would you seat me in? Uh, seat number five. And where's the place this witness has identified the defendant on the court? The record will so reflect. So Officer Anderson, were you equipped with a body on camera that day? Yes, I was. And was it recording? Yes, it was. Have you had, had an opportunity to review the recording? Yes. <coughs> the conversation on the offer State Exhibit 19 recording of Officer Anderson? No, Dick. State Exhibit 19 is admitted for all purposes. Thank you for all submission of photos to the jury. You may. Uh, for purposes of the record, uh, Joshua Anderson's video is a total of 32 minutes and 50 seconds. We're only going to play a portion of that as well. And we'll start at uh, the time of 2.25.
Yes, she was still hooked up. And was that what she was indicating, why she couldn't come out of the room and y'all were ordering out of those rooms early because she was hooked up with IV? I don't know exactly why at that point, but that when I was in the room, that's why she was not trying to leave the room. So stay here to another room. Stay her out of here. Come on. Thank you. 
No, I did not. We have no questions, Your Honor. All right, David, what is your lead? No objection from the State Trial. No from the defense. Thank you, Officer. <clears throat> Call your next witness. The State Trial's uh, Donnie is still in charge. Officer Williams um, from Southwest Patrol. What's your first name? Dominique. You can please spell it for the court reporter. D O M I N I Q U E. Okay, how long have you been with BPD, Officer Williams? Nine years. What's your current assignment? Uh, Southwest CRT. And what is CRT? Crown, crown Response Team. And what is that? What do y'all do with that? We respond to, uh, I guess, high crime areas and uh, saturate the area and also respond to, um, we uh, run warrants and respond to people that do multiple crimes at the same, uh, in the same area. Okay. Were you with BPD uh, on duty on August, I'm sorry, October 22nd, 2022? Yes, sir. Were you with CRT at that time? Uh, no, sir. Okay. What were you doing at that time? Uh, second watch uh, patrol at Southwest. Do you recall responding to an active shooter at the Methodist Central Hospital on that particular day? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you, in fact, respond to that call? Yes, sir. Um, when you got to the hospital, just kind of describe to the jury what was the, uh, the condition of the scene, what was going on when you got there? Uh, just a lot of chaos. Um, a lot of officers stacked up in the hallway. Mm, people running, people pointing. Okay. Um, at some point, did you come into contact with the defendant? Yes, sir. And how was that? How did that come about? Um, once we stacked up on the door to make entry to get him, um, we stacked up, went in, we arrested him, brought him out to the hallway. Um, we laid him on the ground. I uh, put the tourniquet on and cut his pants open. We plugged the, the bullet wound and uh, held pressure until somebody came to help him. Um, can you identify the person that was taken into custody that day? Yes, sir. Okay. 
I think under seat number one, or count seat number two, and only down the line, but seat number one. Seat number five. Ready to represent this witness as identified as defendant in open court. The record will so reflect. Officer Williams, were you wearing a body worn camera that day? Yes, sir. Um, have you had an opportunity to review that body worn camera? Yes, sir. And did the fair and active uh, detention took place that day while you were in the hospital? Yes, sir. Are you officer detention number 22? No objection. Detention number 22 is admitted for all purposes. Mr. Tuller, to the jury. You may. Uh, for Officer Williams, we have a total of 15 minutes, 24 seconds. We're going to play about uh, eight minutes of the video here. The record will start at
whole truth and nothing but the truth that I'll be done. I do. I'm Detective James Mismash, M I S M A S H. And how are you coming for sir? I'm a detective with the Dallas Police Department. Uh, what are you assigned to a particular unit? I am. I'm assigned to the Southwest CRT and Deployment Unit. And what do you do in that unit? Our main assignment is to do rapid apprehension of active offenders. I do. <clears throat> if you can uh, describe for the members of the jury, uh, you, did you respond to the hospital? I did. And uh, describe for the members of the jury what you did when you got there. I arrived at the hospital, um, was led on to elevators uh, up to the fourth floor where I was admitted by some medical personnel that had a card to get the doors unlocked. Um, when I got up there, there were some two other officers that are members of my squad that were performing first aid on a person that was down in the hallway. Um, at that point, one of them had asked me if they needed some cutters, and I had a pair of cutters in my uh, tactical vest, and I helped them with the, uh, the person that had been, they were working on in the hallway. Okay, and the person that they were working on, did you know who that individual was? I did not at the time. Okay, you know who that person is now? Yes, I do. Yes, it was. Yes. Far left side, my, my far left side at the desk, wearing a, a black suit coat, black tie, and gray shirt. I did. <clears throat> I collected a, a pistol magazine that had ammunition in it. Okay. And did you also later on um, tell us what you do after first aid was given to the, to the defendant? Um, I, I picked the magazine up that was laying on the floor because it was still an active scene and I was afraid it would get uh, lost or destroyed. So I picked that up. Uh, the defendant who they were working on was put onto a gurney and he was taken down into the emergency room at which point he was handcuffed. Um, when he got into the emergency room they wanted me to take the cuffs off. I rode down in the elevator. Did you, were you wearing a body worn camera that day? I, w I was. And was it recorded? Yes it was. Thank you. 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 Yes, it was.
Thomas, thank you so much. No question. Make this witness say release. No Don't discuss with each other, don't do any research, don't discuss with anybody else. 